The speaker. House resumes and debate continues. Yes, Senator Douglas, I recognize you here. Okay. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I feel compelled to register my revulsion at the unkind remarks by the member for Grand Bay, the Honorable Vince Henderson, directed at the duly elected member for the Salisbury constituency and leader of the opposition, Honorable Jester, Honorable Jesma Paul Victor, last week Thursday, July 25th in this parliament. I shifted uncomfortably in my seat as Minister Henderson revealed his utter disdain and contempt for the leader of the opposition. He was rude, condescending, and so obviously sexist. Sexist. S-E-X-I-S-T. Yes, Senator, the Honorable Minister is on his feet. Yes, are you standing at point of order? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I... I take offense to what the senator is saying right now, um, insinuating that the, men, the member from Grand Bay was insulted and rude. There was no uh, swearing, no disrespectful language in the minister's speech whatsoever. And the member, the senator from Portsmouth had every opportunity to stand at that time on a point of order to so state if the member from Grand Bay was being disrespectful. So I would beg the speaker to ask the senator to withdraw that statement. Can you repeat, I didn't get it clearly there at the end. Yes. I was saying that there is no nothing on the record, and not to my recollection, that the member from Granby used indecent language, insultive language, or anything in his response to the leader of the opposition. And furthermore, the senator had every opportunity to stand on the point of order if that was the case at the time, and he should have done so. To come now at this late stage to make that statement where persons that listen in might not have heard the original presentation from the member from Granby is very deceitful and misleading. And I would ask the speaker to ask the senator to withdraw that statement. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I see Honorable Rakmo. Yeah, your, your mic was on already. Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, because. Yeah, yeah, you are on already. Come again. Try it last time. Your mic. Your mic. Mr. Mr. Yes, yes. Mr. Speaker, um, consistent with the rules of the House. Yes. When a member stands on a point of order, the yes. Speaker shall sit. Yes, yes, that's true. That's true. That's true. Yes. So, what I would ask, Senator, um, I'm taking the. Um, I've understood the point that the. Honorable member have mentioned specifically, you need to say exactly what you're talking about because I agree with him that it might be misleading if you are just saying just a, a cut blast statement. You know, you'd have to say specifically what because you were in the house and you could have stand on a point of order to ask the honorable um, um, member, the honorable minister Henderson, to withdraw, but you did not. So in that case, you would have to say specifically what you are talking about. Otherwise, you would have to withdraw the statement that he was disrespectful and because I was in the house and I would ask him, and, and oh, and the sexist part is imputing in proper motive. So withdraw that one for sure. Mr. S Mr. Speaker. Yes. The, the number of persons, Mr. Speaker, who 
called me, who called Honorable Jesse Paul Victor afterwards to complain at the manner in which... No, 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 the, the, the number of people out of the house, the, yeah, the sexist part, we draw it first and then okay. we'll deal with the other part. He referred to her several times as she, 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 she. No, he said, he, he had said, he said, the honorable member of opposition he leader. Several times, in a, in a condescending way. No, we're not going to go right back there. I'm saying in regards to sexist. If you say he, 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 it would not be sexist. So you cannot make that statement. Please withdraw the sexist part. I reluctantly, Mr. Speaker, withdraw the sexist part. Yes. Although I know, or I know, I know otherwise, different. Mr. Speaker, yeah, proceed. as a... Yeah, I will answer you too. Trust me. All of us have a history, Dr. Henderson. All of us have a history, okay? Mr. Speaker, as a student of 20th century Dominican politics, I remember vividly the vitriolic attacks suffered by May Eugenia Charles at the hands of some Labour Party cabinet ministers in the mid to late 1970s. I honestly thought, Mr. Speaker, I said some, eh? I honestly thought, Mr. Speaker, that this type of language and conduct had long been banished from our political discourse. I could only hope that the remarks by the minister was a moment of madness which will never be repeated. Mr. Speaker, I now turn... Again, member, again, I'll caution you. Talking about moment of madness is unparliamentary. Is it? You know, so withdraw. Withdraw that statement. Withdraw this statement. Okay, Mr. Speaker. Just focus on your presentation. All as part of the presentation, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. You will not tell me what Proceed. to say, right? You will not tell me what to say. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the 2023-2024 financial statement and budgetary proposals. Mr. Speaker, you may call me naive. You may say I was expecting too much from a government that has produced much but delivered little. Mr. Speaker, there are two fundamental things a government in the most ideal circumstances want, time and money. There's 19 of you elected and five senators, so you have 24 of you. You have enough time to speak. This Labour Party government is now in its fifth term in office and well into its 24th year in power. Grant inflows into Dominica from the EU, from Venezuela, from China, have smashed all records in the last 19 years. Even in the most pessimistic of scenarios, given the number of citizenships that have been processed, well in excess of US $10 billion has been raised from the CBI program in the last decade. The fact that most of that money has not been deposited in the Treasury is another matter. Yet, Mr. Speaker, despite the government having benefited from unprecedented grant inflows from multiple sources, and billions of dollars from the sale of Dominican citizenships. And despite having enjoyed longevity in office, Dominica now finds itself precariously perched on the edge of an economic precipice. Mr. Speaker, the new Minister for Finance, Dr. Irving McIntyre, presented this year's budget well aware of some cold, hard facts. A stagnant economy, high and rising food costs, Lack of buoyancy in the growth engines of the economy, a declining private sector, declining wages, and rising poverty and unemployment. Mr. Speaker, to confront those fundamental and structural problems that Dominica as a country faces, I expected a trans transformational package to help steer the ship of Dominica to calmer waters. When the minister sat down after just under two hours on his feet, I said to myself, Surely, that cannot be it. Mr. Speaker, over the last several years, the government of Dominica has relied heavily on CBI revenues to finance its operations. In the fiscal year 2021-2022, the Economic Citizenship Program contributed 54% to government revenue. 2022-2023, the figure rose to 55%. For this fiscal year, 2023-2024, the government anticipates that the CBI program will contribute 50%, 58% to government revenue. Mr. Speaker, by the figures I have given, you can see how dependent this government is on CBI program revenues. This 58% for this fiscal year is a projection 
of what the government intends to raise from the CBI program. But Mr. Speaker, in light of recent developments, how realistic is it yeah. that government... Yes, yeah, Senator, the Honorable Minister is on his feet. Are you standing on a point of order? Yes, Speaker. Yes, Speaker. Yes, well, yeah. Senator. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I realize that the Senator is reading from his notes, but I cannot recall him asking the permission to do so. Yes, yes, that's true. Senator, are you reading from your notes? Yes, Mr. Speaker, I should have told you in advance. You know, should have asked for permission. Ask for permission. Uh, right, you're correct. You're correct. Yes, so you could do it now. Okay, I'm asking your permission, Mr. Speaker, to read from my notes. Yes, permission granted. This 58%, this 58%, for, rather, but Mr. Speaker, in light of recent developments, how realistic is it that government will raise that amount of money from the CBI program? Mr. Speaker, we now know that a Dominican passport holder needs a visa to enter the United Kingdom. And the European Union has, in the last two weeks, thrown down the gauntlet to countries like Dominica that operate CBI programs. Mr. Speaker, the European Union recently, in the last two weeks, last week, has issued six guidelines. I want to highlight one, the fifth guideline, and I quote, investment must reach the host country. The countries offering CBI programs must properly monitor the flow of funds and verify it against strict money laundering processes. This will include the provision that investment funds must be directly transferred to the host nation under any situation and must not be diverted into accounts in any other country, close quote. Mr. Speaker, this particular stringent measure I have highlighted is significant. For years, the United Workers' Party and its leader, North President Lennox Linton, in particular, have lamented the fact that most of the monies from the sale of Dominican citizenships have not been deposited in the consolidated fund as required by law, but diverted into accounts overseas. This ultimatum for the European Union, Mr. Speaker... M Member, um, I have ruled in regards to the terminology sale of citizenship at ask you to withdraw that. I want that to really be stamped out in Dominica. A lot of people saying about sale of passport, sale of citizenship, withdraw that. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I heard yeah. Dr. Ralph No, it is illegal to sell I passport. Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. No, no, that's Dr. Dr. Ralph Gonzalez's business. Speaking about selling passport. No, no, no. Dr. Ralph Gonzalez is not in Dominica's parliament. And I'm the chairman and the speaker of the house. I'm asking to withdraw. There's no way we are selling passport. So we withdraw that. Mr. Speaker, we are selling citizenship. Withdraw. We are selling citizenship. Withdraw that statement. It is illegal. No. You, do you want to continue or you want to withdraw? Anyway, this side. It's been heard already. No, no. I'll, I'll proceed. Senator. I will draw. I will draw. Nice. So, Mr. Speaker, it is clear for all to see that the CBI program is under serious threat. If the EU decides to follow the UK and impose visa restrictions on Dominican nationals or Dominican passport holders, that will signal the death knell of the CBI program. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance knows. He knows that but has chosen to ignore this looming possibility. Mr. Speaker, even a 20% reduction in CBI program revenues will impact significantly government's ability to meet its commitments. Any figure higher than 20% could trigger a total collapse of the economy. Mr. Speaker, it is really the absence of thinkers and a fundamental lack of creativity in the government that has led to us into this situation where we have had to rely on the CBI to develop our country. Mr. Speaker, that was not the vision of the man who brought the Liberal Party to power in 2000. The position of Rosie Douglas on the sale of citizenship on the CBI in exchange for money was clear and uh, do you, you have to withdraw the part about selling of passport. If you are Dominican, understand where my philosophy is. If it is illegal, but you are a member of parliament saying we're doing something illegal. Please withdraw it and not, say clearly what you withdraw. I am not saying it's illegal. I'm not saying no, no. it's illegal. I'm not no, saying no. that. I am telling you it is illegal to do that. So you can't say it in the house. Mr. Uh, you mean, 
You can. Okay, I withdraw. So, no, no. So, say which part exactly are you withdrawing? Sell of citizenship in exchange for money, I withdraw. Okay. Proper and correct. So, from no one in this honorable house, I want it to be clear that I'm not going to accept that. This is illegal to say that. Not illegal to say it, but illegal to do it. And therefore, we have to set a certain standard in the house. We cannot, as Dominicans, be saying that in Parliament, as if we accept that. We are not on the block. So, Mr. Speaker, what exactly are we doing? So, let us continue. And please, if you try to challenge it here, I'll ask you to take your seat. Proceed and show the chair respect. Move on. Mr. Speaker, it's extraordinary, really. I mean, you have 19 seats, you have five senators, and you have the Speaker of the House on your side, and yet still, I'm not allowed to, to present. Again, you are inputting improper motive. I am giving you a final chance to deliver. If you input any improper motive, again, I'll ask you to take your seat. You are now attacking the chair now. Okay, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the point I, I, I want to make is that Rosie Douglas helped to get Labour Party into power, and his position on the CBI programs was clear and unambiguous. Right? I want to show you, Mr. Speaker. It says here, I'm quoting, it's not, that's, not, that's not my words, our citizenship not for sale. That was a chronicle of Friday, September 1, 2000, our citizenship not for sale. Just putting that. I just wanted to bring that to the house. Everybody can see it. Mr. Speaker, in 1999, in advance of the January 31st general election 2000, the Labour Party produced a booklet captioned Labour Power under the subheading Why They Must Go, referring to the United Workers Party. Point 16, page of the document reads, I'm quoting from a document, Mr. Speaker, it's not me talking. Point 16, page for the document reads, and I quote, the document. A document that the Labour Party produced in, in 1999, 2000. I can, I can get it, Mr. Speaker, I can, I can get it for you. Yeah, but you have to refer to it. You cannot just say you're quoting from a document. Okay, yeah, proceed. So point, six, point 16 page of the document reads, sold, Dominican, sold thousands of Dominican passports and prostituted Dominican citizenship, close quote. Mr. Speaker, fast forward to July 18th, 2023. 24 years later, and look at the reason given by the British government to impose a visa requirement on Dominicans. I'm quoting there from the Home Secretary, Suela Breverman clear and evident abuse of a citizenship by investment scheme, including the granting of citizenship to individuals known to pose a risk to the UK, close quote. So, Mr. Speaker, the Labour Party issued a warning 24 years ago about our passports ending up in the hands of criminals during the reign of the United Workers Party. Today, 24 years later, we find our passports are ending up in the hands of criminals and bandits under a Labour Party government. We are now paying a heavy price due to the manner in which Dominica CBI program has operated. Geothermal energy development. Mr. Speaker, of course, the impression is given, the impression is being given, certainly in the debate so far, that the geothermal energy development program started with the Honorable Vince Henderson. People have gone as far as calling him Mr. Geothermal, or saying that steam is coming out of the back of his head. Mr. Speaker, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, Crispin Gregoire did much of the early work to get the program off the ground. Mr. Speaker, can the members allow me to speak Yes, please allow the senator to speak. Mr. Speaker, in 2001, Crispin Gregoire, under instructions from the then Prime Minister Pierre Charles, put together a consortium that included the OAS, the Climate Institute, 
and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, two grants were raised from the Global Environment Facility, Jeff, which covered the first set of surveys of geothermal resources. Rise on a point, I think, of order. What is the relevance of this history class we're going to? Yes, um, to but question. again, when, when a member is on a, his own feet in regards to a point that he should take your seat, um, the Honorable Minister asked what is the relevance of it. So you have to get to your point because questions have been asked in regards to relevance already. Mr. Yes. Speaker, yes. we're talking about geothermal. The Minister of Energy, people have been saying that you know he's been the one and the one and all that. But I'm saying that the Geothermal Energy Development Program has a history. And it's a brief history I'm giving. Very brief history. Maybe a paragraph. From, that's it. That's it. Yeah. I'm but, yes, but what is it relevant to the budget? But of course, it is, of course it's relevant. You need to know the, the history of the program. It didn't, start, it didn't start yesterday. It started in 2001. Mm -hmm. Can I proceed? Yes, yeah, proceed. Okay. By 2006, or rather in 2006, by now Dominica's ambassador to the United Nations, Christian Gregoire, cultivated the interests of the French Fund for Environment, FFEM, and the Agence Française de Développement to provide matching funds for a grant from the EU. Mr. Speaker, that initiative raised 5.5 million euros, which served as a targeted funding for studies in the Roseau Valley. In 2007, Mr. Gregor negotiated a technical cooperation agreement with Iceland. When the present Minister for Energy, Honorable Vince Henderson, arrived at the UN in 2010, he picked New Zealand as the new technical partner. I just wanted to make it clear, Mr. Speaker, that before the present Energy Minister arrived on the scene, much of the preparatory work on geothermal energy development had already taken place. And while I'm still on the subject of geothermal energy, this house, this house, and the people of Dominica, Mr. Mr. Henderson, Dr. Henderson, this house and the people of Dominica are still awaiting a breakdown of all the money spent in Soufriere on the geothermal project in that community. We know millions of dollars were spent, but we are unclear who got paid and how much? Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, with respect to education, there's a general feeling of mismanagement within the Ministry of Education. The government has yet to appoint a chief education officer who has been acting for six long years. Mr. Speaker, we hear of several appointments from the very top of square pegs in wrong holes. There's a perception, there's a perception, Mr. Speaker, that members of parliament on the government side are interfering in the due process of appointing principals island-wide, resulting in a number of incapable and incompetent principals in our schools. I'm waiting for the Minister of Education to clarify the widespread view that education- I stand on the point of order, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> yes, yes, Honorable Minister. I, I, I believe it is improper, input, input improper motive. Members of Parliament do not appoint civil servants. That is done by the Public Service Commission, Mr. Members Speaker. of Parliament do not appoint civil servants. That's the responsibility of the Civil Service Commission. And the Senator is implying that we essentially sideline in the Civil Service Commission. So that is implying improper motive, Mr. Speaker. I would ask the Senator to withdraw that statement. No, 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 Mr. Speaker, I'm clear what I said, you know. I said there's a perception that... Yes, yes, yes I, I, saw, I saw when you said, I, I listened to the perception part. Um, so continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm waiting for the Minister of Education to clarify the widespread belief that education officers have been appointed mainly along party political lines. You can answer when, you, when your, your time comes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the standard of, of the equipment at our schools, including science and computer labs, is well below what is expected. In addition, the quantum of resources being placed in our schools have been dwindling progressively over the years. Increasingly, Mr. Speaker, many teachers quite often have to purchase from their pockets a lot of resources needed in our schools. Schools increasingly have had to embark on massive fundraising drives as government is unable to provide adequate assistance to schools 
to ensure that they have supplies at the, in the right quantities, or rather, they have the right supplies and the right quant qu quantities. Mr. Speaker, large numbers of students have been promised scholarships and sent overseas, but the government has been unable to meet its obligations in a timely manner to these students, creating frustration for students and parents alike. And that, Mr. Speaker, is an undisputed fact. Mr. Speaker, it is very clear that many scholarship, re scholarship re recipients are in one way or the other affiliated to a parliamentary representative and or a government minister. Mr. Speaker, there is inadequate but, sports but, equipment. But member, this is really imputing improper motive. Mr. I mean, which, which, why, which, why, which, 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 specific, which specific part? Where you are actually pointing to ministers of government. Okay, Mr. Speaker, I withdraw. But I, what I've said, I know is the truth. But you see, you can't disrespectfully withdraw. Okay, you cannot Mr. say you withdraw, but what you're saying is true. That means you have not withdrawn. I mean, we, we are adults here. We can't be playing tricks with the rules. When we use the word technical, technically using perception, but sliding in and imputing improper motive. I mean, I'm seeing it. I just allow you to move on. You have, you have um, nine more minutes. Mr. Speaker, all the interruptions. Yeah, yeah, I had, I had a little bit of time for that. Mr. Speaker. You also, you started at 303. You also, also end at 333. But I had a little, like five minutes for all the interjection. Also, I gave you, I gave you extra time, five minutes. So Mr. let's Speaker, just continue. The government has announced its intention to build an international airport in the Wesley area. That's all you have on me, you know, Mr. Henderson. The airport, we are told, will be financed by the Citizenship by Investment Program. But, Mr. Speaker, for a project of that magnitude and scope, the government from the very beginning should have sought to get the entire country to buy into the project. But so far, what we've seen is that this project has been increasingly politicized. Mr. Speaker, there's just so much at stake, too much that can go wrong. If this government gets it wrong with this airport project, the damage to the environment and the disruption to the livelihoods of thousands of people could be reparable. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has told us that the airport will cost $1.3 billion to complete. I suspect that may be a ballpark figure. I don't know how the Prime Minister has arrived at that, at that figure when we know that several critical studies have not been completed. Mr. Speaker, I have a few questions read the proposed international airport. Is this government acting in compliance with the Planning Act with respect, with respect to works now ongoing on the proposed airport? When will the environmental and social impact assessments be made available to the public? Has any report been completed on the economic and financial viability of this airport? Crucially, Mr. Speaker, I think it's important to find out how many economic citizens will we have to find to build and finance this airport? Mr. Speaker, is this government still confident that it can finance the airport from CBI program funds? Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, agriculture's contribution to GDP has declined from approximately 26% in 2000 to about 16.3% in 2022. The Ministry of Agriculture, Fishes, and Blue and Green Economy has announced a target that agriculture's contribution to GDP will move from $274 million in 2022 to $700 million by 2030. Mr. Speaker, I have not met one person within the, the, Ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture who genuinely believes that this target can be met. Mr. Speaker, I have been told that the President Minister of Agriculture, the MP for Cottage, Alba Roland Rory, I've been told that he's technically sung, and in the first few months of his appointment, met with farmers across the country. But Mr. Speaker, he is not a magician. Mr. Speaker, I will explain why this target of $700 million is highly unlikely to be met. Alba Rory, you have inherited a sector that has been decimated after years of underinvestment. 
The government has just not invested nearly enough in the agricultural sector over the last two decades. The poor state of feeder roads nationally has forced many farmers to abandon their farms. The sector cannot move forward unless significant sums are invested in feeder roads island-wide, especially in places like Salisbury, Calibish, and Cassipus. Mr. Speaker, there is a major problem in Dominica as regards the availability of labor, the reliability of labor, and the cost of labor. These are issues that cannot be solved easily and would need proper planning. Mr. Speaker, the average age of a farmer today is 57. To move the sector out of the doldrums, a cadre of young farmers must be encouraged to start farming as a business. Mr. Speaker, the high cost of agricultural inputs and agrochemicals has had a negative impact on the sector. In the recent past, government has received two shipments of fertilizer from the Kingdom of Morocco, but sadly, Mr. Speaker, many of those bags of fertilizer have ended up in the hands of Labour Party supporters. Is that input in proper motives, Mr. Speaker? Yes, it is input in proper motive. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, while, the agriculture, while in Dominica the agricultural sector is dogged by multiple issues and challenges, challenges, our neighbors are doing much better than us. Four more minutes. I move on a what do you want to offer? Ten minutes for the senator. Who's going to second it? Second the motion. So how many minutes? I, I, I second the motion so that the member can have more opportunities to embarrass himself. How many minutes we, we propose? Ten. Okay. It has been moved and seconded that the honorable senator be given an additional ten minutes. Those in favor? Those against? The eyes are it. Senator, you are given an additional 10 minutes. Thank you, members. Thank you. But, Senator, before you proceed, if you input any improper motive again, I'm going to ask you to take your seat. Because you know, because you actually told me this is input in improper motive, so you know. So proceed. Mr. Speaker, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is leading the way in root crop production, and St. Lucia, for many years now, has restarted exporting bananas to the United Kingdom. Mr. Speaker, as we seek to reposition our country post-CBI, we need a paradigm shift in our whole thinking. Government should encourage private citizens to be self-sufficient in meeting their electricity needs by providing incentives for them to purchase solar panels and wind turbines and hydro where possible. Several members of the private sector are leading the way in the installation of solar panels at their businesses, KFC, Auto trade, among others. Mr. Speaker, all new buildings, all new government buildings, and those which can be retrofitted should be energy efficient and renewable energy compliant. This can be achieved by installing green roofs and energy efficient features. The private sector should be encouraged through the tax system to order energy efficient home appliances, including fridges. You ask for, for solutions and suggestions, I'm giving them to you. Mr. Speaker, as we advance towards our, our dream, as we advance towards achieving our green objectives, we should also aim to transition from propane-powered stoves to electric stoves. Dominica has more than enough geothermal energy to meet its export, to meet, to meet its needs for export and local. I can move to electric stove in, 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 anytime. Should geothermal energy take off, it will be a game changer for the Dominican economy. With cheap electricity, Dominica will be able to attract companies from all over the world, especially those that use large amounts of electricity. We'll be able to attract data storage companies like Google, for instance. These initiatives will produce high paying jobs. The production of hydrogen from the geothermal plant will allow Dominica to provide fuel to ships, opening up new possibilities for Dominica in a very new and big area. Mr. Speaker, I, I now move to the person of constituency. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, I live, I live in Portsmouth, Mr. Speaker. I live in Portsmouth. And the person that the Member of Parliament for Portsmouth described a few days ago is not the person I know and the person the vast majority of people know. But the fact is, the fact is Mr. Speaker, the Member of Parliament for Portsmouth is not the one who actually runs what's happening in Portsmouth. The people who actually run Portsmouth right now is not Honorable Finella Wenham. The people who actually run Portsmouth right now are Emmanuel Nanton and... But Julie Member, Nanton. Member... You cannot call people's name in the house okay, unless it is positive. Mr. Speaker, this is the first time I'm calling names, so... No, I'm but... Yeah. I never call her. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, I withdraw. <laughs> but the point I want to make, Mr. Speaker... Yeah. The point I want yeah. to make, Mr. Speaker, is... A point of order? Honorable Wenham, are you going to put your mic on the mic? Yes. Mr. Speaker, I heard my name. <laughs> so I'm standing and I'm listening. So I'm waiting to hear. Yes, well, honorable, you, you have to stand on a point of order. But that is the point of you, order, Mr. Yes. Speaker. You're referring to me. No, no, you can't. You can't. So you have to take your seat. Yeah. Take that your seat. That's quite unbecoming. Yeah. Take your seat. Yeah. Um, Senator. Mr. Speaker, we are looking at, Mr. Speaker, a one-term parliamentary representative. And I'll move on, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the town of Portsmouth has not recovered from the departure of Ross University in 2018. The university was the backbone of the Portsmouth economy. The school employed over 300 people directly and hundreds more indirectly. It had a student population of just under 1,400 students. It's been estimated that Ross University contributed as much as 30% to our country GDP at the time of its departure from Dominica. Mr. Speaker, very few people know the full facts surrounding the departure of Ross University from Portsmouth. I believe that there are lessons to be learned from this development. An independent commission of inquiry should be set up to establish all the facts surrounding the departure of Ross University from Dominica. But I realize, Mr. Speaker, that this commission of inquiry will never happen unless there's a change of government. Mr. Speaker, while I welcome the announcement of this American Canadian Medical School and its op starting operation in September of this year, the people of Portsmouth are desperate for investment and de we are desperate for jobs and we openly welcome this new school. I call on the people of Portsmouth, Mr. Speaker, to embrace warmly this new school with the same passion and commitment that we embrace Ross University over the last over the 40 years that they spent in Dominica. Mr. Speaker, the current state of the Regional Armour Hospital in Portsmouth is indeed a tragedy. This hospital in Portsmouth performed many different operations over 40 years ago. But Mr. Speaker, what we have in Portsmouth now is not a hospital, but a transfer station. One simply gets to go there to be transferred to Roseau. Mr. Speaker, I see no allocation in the estimates for this year for the rehabilitation in terms of an allocation for the Portsmouth Hospital. I hope that the Minister for Health, when he comes to speak, he will clarify that. Mr. Speaker, I, 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 I go to the hospital quite often, and I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that the late John Fabian, the former Minister for Health, must be turning in his grave to see how the Portsmouth Hospital has deteriorated. Mr. Speaker, in 2006, when the government received modern equipment from Cuba, valued at over $7 million, Boston Hospital was destined to be a very modern facility. Today, Mr. Speaker, it's in shambles. Mr. Speaker, in Portsmouth, we have two world-renowned and world-class hotels, with guests paying top dollar at these quality hotels, Secret Bay and Cabbage Resort and Spa. Mr. Speaker, it's a matter of urgency that the Regional Armour Hospital be given a total rehabilitation in terms of physical structure, medical personnel, and the procedures performed. Electoral reform. Six more, six more minutes, sir. Thank you. 
sorry, six more minutes. The proposed reforms to our electoral laws, as proposed by Sir Dennis Byron, are too watered down and will not, fundamental, will not change fundamentally the present electoral system. I welcome the discussion involving a wide cross-section of the Dominican population scheduled for later this week on electoral reform and subsequent sessions on electoral reform involving all shades of political opinion. It is my hope, Mr. Speaker, that the government will not take all three readings of the bills on electoral reform to Parliament at a single sitting. There should be at least a two-month gap between the first and second and third readings of the bill. Mr. Speaker, the 2023-2024 budget ignores the huge economic hit the economy will take should the CBI program be impacted negatively by international events. One such event would be the European Union ending visa-free access to the EU for Dominican citizens. Mr. Speaker, the budget does not lay out a clear path that would transform our economy in a post-CBI world. Dominica's economy, Dominica's economic future rather, depends heavily on energy independence, a hybrid of geothermal, hydro, solar, and wind. The country needs to build on its strengths by investing heavily, we've not done that, in agriculture and tourism. Mr. Speaker, we need as a matter of urgency to be looking at exporting our water. 24 years in office, we're not exporting water. Mr. Speaker, the CBI program has no long-term future. We need to transition ourselves out of the CBI program into new economic initiatives. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that this budget, this year's budget, is the weakest budget ever presented by this government, and I've read all of them from 2000. Mr. Speaker, the budget does not prepare Dominicans for the choppier waters that are immediately ahead. Mr. Speaker, there is a real possibility, whether we like it or not, that Dominica may well have to go back to the International Monetary Fund in this fiscal year for the first time since 2006. Mr. Speaker, while there are some projects and initiatives in this budget that I support, overall, I cannot support the budget in its totality. There is no clear overarching vision, and it fails to spell out in detail what the government would do to make up the shortfall in the event of a sharp fall in CBI revenues. Mr. Speaker, this budget address is a clear admission that this government has thro effectively thrown in the towel. And, Madam, Mr. Speaker, the longer they stay in power, Mr. Speaker, and the longer they stay in power, the harder it will, the harder will be the landing for the Dominican economy. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yes, I recognize the Minister, Minister Honorable Charles, but uh, just a comment, Mr. Minister, before you continue, I have exercised maximum, maximum patience with the Senator. Senator, I hope you appreciate it. Also, I caution this morning that members on the opposition side, I will say it now, need to be more disciplined with their time. Can you imagine that the, the senator wanted extra time and he did not even have a member on his side to second the motion? Huh? We need to take this thing seriously. That is why I say we need to set some rules. We can't be members of parliament and say, using illegal terminology to, to, to explain our, our, our arguments on the CBI program when we know they are illegal statements. We need to be serious. Honorable Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give my firm support to the 2023 2024 budget estimates as brilliantly presented by Honorable Dr. Irvin McIntyre, one of the most realistic budgets of our time, Mr. Speaker. 
But Mr. Speaker, before I do go into the gist of my contribution, permit me to send greetings to the beautiful and loving and loyal people of the Sufra constituency who I know are listening right now, Mr. Speaker, and to all my mentors teaching at the summer school program taking place uh, for a month in the constituency, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate. I want to congratulate the Honorable Jessima Paul for being the first female leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker. I think, Mr. Speaker, the opposition leader office is one of the highest office in our land, Mr. Speaker, so I want to congratulate her. And I also want to say, Mr. Speaker, to congratulate the Honorable Prime Minister for being a leader, Mr. Speaker, who has ensured gender balance in this parliament, Mr. Speaker, because Dominica's parliament is one of the one of the one of the one of the parliaments that has the most women in parliament in the world, Mr. Speaker. Yes, yes, yes. So, Mr. Speaker, I listened to the honourable leader of the opposition, and Mr. Speaker, I heard her saying that she, she started off, Mr. Speaker, saying she would like to follow the footsteps of the, my cousin, the great Dame Eugenia Charles, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I get up, I anticipate it, because if you want to follow the footsteps of the great Dame, then I expect to hear a rebuttal that resembles and represents the great Dame Eugenia Charles, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Well, you see, after your history, you have to know where people are from. J.B. Charles, I, but that's not history class, though. we'll talk later. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, as I sat down, Mr. Speaker, a creepy feeling came over me, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, all I could remember, Mr. Speaker, were all the budget contributions of the former opposition leader, Mr. Speaker. I even scared to call his name, Mr. Speaker. They were empty, nothing to offer the hard-working people of Dominica, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition went to talk about electoral reform, Mr. Speaker. And I recalled just a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister had a national presentation in the State House. Civic organizations were there, church leaders, United Workers Party was there, Freedom Party was there. APP was there. Everybody was represented. The only empty position that was not represented at that national council presentation was the opposition leader office. That is how serious she is about electoral reform, Mr. Speaker. And when they talk about song bites, that is song bite, Mr. Speaker. Her song bite. Mr. Speaker, and the Honorable Sean Douglas said we are scared. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we want electoral reform. We are on record saying that. We want the list to be cleansed. We are saying that, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, when he, all of a sudden, the Dr. Dennis Byron report, they were all excited about it. They cannot wait for In fact, they even said that's why we rushed to call the election, because we were afraid to receive the great Dennis Byron report, Mr. Speaker. And today, the Honorable Douglas is saying it's a watered-down report. And the leader of the opposition said that she's scared of the report. You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because she said, because of that report, mm -hmm. they can never win the Dominica Labour Party by ballot, Mr. Speaker. But that is the only way to win elections in Dominica. And the last election is a testament that whether diasporans <laughs> come down or not, we will beat them, Mr. Speaker, any day, any opposition party. Yes. So, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> the leader of the opposition went on to talk about climate change. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we all know that Dominica is one of the least contributors to carbon dioxide emissions. We are one of the least. But we are on the front line. Every Caribbean country, island in the OECS, is on the front line of of climate change, Mr. Speaker. We have Erica, Maria to prove it. And people don't like us to talk about it, Mr. Speaker. 
But there are constituents today and Dominicans that are still suffering because of those storms in Speaker. And as much as the Labour Party is on a rush to build 5,000 homes, Mr. Speaker, the damages caused have been so significant, Mr. Speaker. And that is why Dr. Mark, in his presentation, gave the context on which he was presenting this budget. He said, these are uncertain times. I don't think they heard it. There we are, there are lingering effects, the scars from climatic events and the pandemic. And now the Ukraine-Russia war, quarter inflation, he gave the backdrop. So, Mr. Speaker, I expected the opposition leader, knowing how Dominica has been impacted by climate change, to come and speak about the Paris Agreement in the light of asking the developed countries to honor their commitment they made. But she is accusing us of not meeting our commitment. Magwesa, Mr. Speaker. Your country <laughs> decimated by Erica and Maria. Your barrage about Paris Agreement? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that is why I said to you, Mr. Speaker, have to be careful, Mr. Speaker. What they are reading in this house, this is serious business, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, instead, for her, Mr. Speaker, and then she went on to speak about the CBI program. <clears throat> and I, I said, oh, she finally has realized how important the CBI program is to the country, Mr. Speaker. Because they have spent years, Mr. Speaker, that eyeing the CBI program to the rest of the world, Mr. Speaker. And today, she wants to come to the house and talk about a visa imposed by the UK on our 45th anniversary, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we, Dominica, has contributed to the development of the United Kingdom, Mr. Speaker. Whether before independence or by the number of Dominicans in that country who have helped to build the economy, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, if she is so, if she is so concerned about not having the CBI revenue, what I thought she would have done is pen an open letter to the UK government, Mr. Speaker, to say that how important this program is to helping us continue to invest in sustainable development projects, Mr. Speaker, or ask the Prime Minister how we can join forces to let the international community know that we are running a safe and secure program, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know how life is, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, anybody could be granted citizenship today. And tomorrow, something happens, Mr. Speaker. That is life. And as a responsible government, we revoke those applications, Mr. Speaker. That is what we do. So we are running a very secure program, Mr. Speaker. Yes. But there will always be challenges, Mr. Speaker. Right. No country exists today without challenges, Mr. Speaker. So I, I don't understand that that is a stand she's taking on the CBI today because they are happy, Mr. Speaker, that we have a little challenge, Mr. Speaker. They are not interested in joining us to, to explain to the international public how important the CBI is to us, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to say to you that this is why this government under the Honorable Roosevelt Spirit use that money to invest in sustainable development projects. And I will speak to it later in my contribution when I talk about the accommodation sector. But in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, you can see the roads Dominica have today. Dominica is, is held for having one of the best roads in the Caribbean, Mr. Speaker. You saw after Hurricane Maria, how we swiftly move into action, Mr. Speaker, to clear roads. If you had seen Sufura, Mr. Speaker, when I woke up the day after Hurricane Maria, I cried, you know, Mr. Speaker. First time in my life, Mr. Speaker, when I went to pray, it was hard for words to come out. Because when I saw how, this, how damaged our country was, Mr. Speaker, but because of the CBI, we were able to restore this country where people thought it would take us 25 years to rebound. We are standing and we are shining, Mr. Speaker. And the figures in the Ministry in Tourism will show that, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, they said, Dominica experienced in poverty. As if Dominica is the only country in the world to have poor people, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, Dominican, this government, Mr. Speaker, recognizing our people have been impacted, Mr. Speaker, from the time we lost preferential treatment, Mr. Speaker, from UK, our economy has been impacted. This government is one of the only governments that is investing and providing for the most vulnerable in our society. Whether it's housing to ensure everybody has a comfortable home to sleep in. Education, Mr. Speaker, you know, back in the day, you had to have a surname or a job title to get a loan to go and pursue higher education. It is under this government that anybody, any child, poor mother with children, anybody, Mr. Speaker, regardless of who you are, can get an opportunity to achieve higher education and realize their dreams because of this Dominican Liberal Party government. We are making investments to bring people up and out of poverty, Mr. Speaker. So to come here and talk about poverty as if Dominicans are poor, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, the honorable member for Rosso Central went on to let you know how the economy is expanding, Mr. Speaker. People are making investments in Rosso. Jolis is expanding, doing a new building in Portsmouth, Mr. Speaker. And when I get to the accommodation sector, I will let you know the expansion going on there, Mr. Speaker. But we have more supermarkets now and more modern supermarkets now in Dominica than we've ever had, Mr. Speaker. That is the confidence the private sector has in the country. Taxi operators today, Mr. Speaker, we put some money at the aid bank, quickly run to get some funds to invest in coastal buses under five years, Mr. Speaker, taking advantage of it. Why? Because we have a booming cruise industry, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, this government is making the investments to ensure that every Dominican can, re every Dominican can realize his or her dream. And Honorable Brand spoke about the digital economy, Mr. Speaker, so I don't need to go into that. And the Minister of Agriculture, my gosh, the Minister of Agriculture took his time, line by line, in detail, to explain all the programs and projects to 700 million. Line by line. I was so impressed, Mr. Speaker. And for members, Honorable Douglas, to come and say to this House, Mr. Speaker, that we are not making investments in agriculture. This government has made the most investment in agriculture, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. But Mr. Speaker, every time we bring the industry up, Erica, down. Bring it up again, Maria, down. Come on, Mr. Speaker. It's as if we're living in two different Dominicans. We have to be real about what is happening in our country. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't spend much time on agriculture because, as I said, the Minister of Agriculture took spent time in explaining. And Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition, talking about doom and gloom. Are you here in a country that is experiencing doom and gloom that you're going to increase salaries by 13% for public servants? Restructuring in a time of doom and gloom? Who does that, Mr. Who does Speaker? That? Who does that? I mean, come on. You know, Mr. Speaker, I went to check some records, Mr. Speaker, and we have a 7% increase in vehicles importation in Dominica, Mr. Speaker. Who does that in an economy that has doom and gloom, Mr. Speaker? And I spoke about the expansion, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and she went on to boast about funeral homes making the most money, Mr. Speaker. Very disappointed, Mr. Speaker. Because, Mr. Speaker, as leaders, we have to take our responsibility seriously. We have a lot of fatal accidents on the road. We have to advocate for people to drive safer on the road, Mr. Speaker. That is what we must do as leaders. Not come here and say that funeral homes are the best performing businesses in Dominica. Very, very, very disappointed, Mr. Speaker. And I, as I said to you, I expected more because she came with a hype, Mr. Speaker, referring to the great Dave Eugenia. But the more I listened to her, the more I realized she was, uh, she's as empty as the former leader of opposition, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm not sexist, sir. Eh? I'm not sexist. All right. So they didn't want the Honorable Henderson to say it, so I'll say it, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, Dr. Uh, Senator Paris, the engineer, went on to speak about the story he saw in the budget estimates, Mr. Speaker. 
that the tourism industry is not performing, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, Honorable Henderson, who, who um, rose and said that there needs to be a reset in tourism, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I remember her earlier this year saying to me that she applied to DDA for a job because she was so in marketing. I think she applied for marketing assistant position, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, I think she told me she didn't get called for interview. I didn't expect her to have an open interview in the house, Mr. Speaker. I didn't anticipate that. Because Mr. Speaker, she tried to lay down her credentials as a marketing professional, Mr. Speaker. And I, I respect that. All power to her, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, to be a marketing professional, you must talk with research from a research position, Mr. Boy, Speaker. Yeah. You must have data and facts when you're making a presentation, not fluff. Mr. Speaker, I'll be sending another point of order for a while now. The, um, the member from... The Honourable Minister of the Tourism. Honorable Minister of the Honourable Minister of Tourism is infusing improper motives. Yes, yeah, specifically what you said. The data, the data I presented was data from the budget. So it was not an interview because I'm very qualified, let me just say, graduate of honours, so I'm not coming for a job. This is data from the, it shows, this is data. So that's my point of order, Mr. Speaker. So she's imputing the proper motives. Don't attack my, my, my qualification and what I know about marketing. Don't try that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, proceed on over, Minister. Okay, I don't, I don't understand. I said, no, no, but she should get her she must be researched. Get her data, don't Mr. Speaker. That. Don't try that. So so no, Mr. Speaker. Yes, no. I'm sorry, Mr. So Mr. Speaker, I want to advise her, Mr. Speaker. If she really wants to be a marketing professional, she don't have to wait to get a job and discover Dominic authority to do so. She can do like a good lawyer we know, Mr. Speaker. Uh, she wouldn't mind me calling her name, Anika Bellot, Mr. Speaker, who is a known lawyer by profession, but on Instagram is known as Nature Isle Nikki, the real God, Mr. Speaker, yes. for the excellent work she's doing and promoting destination Dominica. So, Mr. Speaker, let me share some information, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Dominica has received a lot of accolades and awards in the last fiscal year, Mr. Speaker. Up till today, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I was at a conference and one uh, media professional said, which other island has done that, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I speak about, and please allow me to refer to my notes from time to time. I speak about Time Magazine. Permission granted. Who's, uh, as the world's, who said, a haven of lush greenery, mountains, and adventure. No more accessible than ever with the first ever direct flight from the U.S. mainland. We have been in travel and leisure, featured in Sports Illustrated, Lonely Planet, CNN 25 Most Beautiful Places, Forbes, Mr. Speaker, and the list goes on and on. And Mr. Speaker, what I would like to say, the people writing over Dom I didn't. we did not stay there and send pictures to them, you know, and they wrote over Dom Dicker. They were here visiting the island, experiencing our product just as it is. And by all reports, all of them agree that Dominica is the most beautiful island in the Caribbean, Mr. Speaker. We have the most diverse assets. So, Mr. Speaker, and the stats are here to prove it. Our visit arrivals, Mr. Speaker. And sorry, Honorable Anderson, these stats you cannot find in a budget estimate. I simply walk, walk to the Ministry of Tourism or discover Dominica and the Sudrid. We would have gotten the information. I would have helped you because you're female and I want you to move well and shine in Parliament. But I want you to do so with facts, not fiction. Do so with facts. So, Mr. Speaker, in the French West Indies, compared to 2021, 2022, Mr. Speaker, we had a 402% rebound in the French West Indies compared to 2021, 2022. And Mr. Speaker, compared to 2019, 2020, we are only 2% from fully recovering in that market, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, in the United States, we saw a 61% increase in visitor arrivals 2022-2023 compared to 2021-2022. A 73 and a 73% increase over 2019-2020, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the United Kingdom, we saw a 92% increase in visitors in 2022-2023 compared to 2021-2022, and a 22% increase compared to 2019-2020. Mr. Speaker, in Canada, we saw a 102% increase in visitors compared to 2021-2022, and a 15% increase compared to 2019-2020, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the data shows a story, a story not found in the estimates, but it's available information of how well we are rebounding in the tourism industry, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, we are not stopping there, Mr. Speaker, because we are on our mission to make Dominica the number one destination the most desired destination by all visitors, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to say in the cruise industry, Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, during COVID-19, remember when I became Minister of Tourism, a couple months after we had COVID-19, yes. and that was the worst um, a disaster to beat the tourism industry. The industry was the first to close and the last to reopen, Mr. Speaker, because all borders were closed. And during that time of downtime, we spent our time and we looked over our data for 10 years, Mr. Speaker. And what we did was a remaking of the industry, Mr. Speaker, which I'll share with you later. I'll share several times, but some people seem they don't want to hear or they don't want to see, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, in the cruise industry, we have a similar story of the number of cruise visitors. And, Mr. Speaker, our performance in the cruise industry is the best in 10 years, Mr. Speaker. In 2022-2023, we had 246,547 visitors. This sent back, Mr. Speaker, to go on tours. In 2019, which is deemed as one of the best years, we only had 173. So, Mr. Speaker, so, and Mr. Speaker, we have surpassed, so we have surpassed pre band pre pandemic levels by 30%. And this year, Mr. Speaker, we expect to even surpass. Next, next school season, we start in October. We expect to even surpass the last school season, Mr. Speaker, by 23%. Data, facts, not fiction, not fluff, not song bites and fluff. Facts, yes, facts. numbers, take note Listen, of the numbers. Take notes. And Mr. Speaker, when I go to the accommodation, um, Statistics, Mr. Speaker, about our hoteliers, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I must hand it off to Dominica Hoteliers and Resorts. And I really have to thank the Prime Minister for brilliantly engineering the CBI program to invest in resorts, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Because you know it's the Dominica Labour Party. Because of that genius of the Prime Minister, we had the first five-star resort in no rebranded as Intercontinental Cambridge Resort and Spa. Yes, yes, yes. As you know, Intercontinental is one of the largest hotel chains in the world, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, it's amazing how well our resorts are doing, Mr. Speaker. I, Mr. Speaker, every time I turn, I'm getting a message from one of our hoteliers, Mr. Speaker. I must commend them. See, in this industry, it doesn't take the Ministry of Tourism alone. All stakeholders, tourism workers, taxi operators, the vendors on the bayfront, and every Dominican has to push to market the, the destination, Mr. Speaker, because it's a competitive industry, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, Secret Bay, a CBI property, has been on Travel and Leisure World's Best Award twice. So, little secret bay, Mr. Speaker, is, uh, thank you, is wow. being elevated. Thank you, free time, Mr. Speaker. So, she was supporting my point because of many ago, she said that we need to reset tourism, but she's supporting me. Free time, Mr. Speaker, a CBI property, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Doing so well, Mr. Speaker. 
and is now elevated as one of the best resorts in the world, Mr. Speaker. Little Secret Bay, Mr. Speaker. Secret Bay. And has expanded, Mr. Speaker. Secret Bay. And I'll give you this stats in a while on how many rooms we expect from Secret Bay, Mr. Speaker. I think we have 126 rooms. Mr. Speaker, you have Fortune Hotel. Fortune Hotel right there. Who opened up for, so we can, what's our cricketers, Mr. Speaker? They haven't done the official opening, Mr. Speaker, but they added an additional 60 rooms. Who does that in an economy that is dooming, Mr. Is doomed, Mr. Speaker? Investment, Mr. Speaker. Nobody does make investments in an in a economy, Mr. Speaker, that is doomed. Mr. Speaker, we have Jungle Bay being featured as having one of the best, being one of the best all-inclusive resorts in the Caribbean, Mr. Speaker. You have Fulibri Ridge, one of the best sustainable hotel, hotels in the world, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our resorts are on travel and weekly, travel weekly, hospitality net, um, funding us travel. Mr. Speaker, all major publications, Tom Nickel Resorts, are being listed and hailed for excellent service and our sustainable practices, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, hats off to our stakeholders in the tourism industry, Mr. Speaker, for their efforts and their investment, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, we, you know we have under 1,000 hotel rooms, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, with the other resorts under construction, like Sanctuary Eco Resort, We'll add another 90 rooms, Mr. Speaker. And we all await Marriott and Nishi and Hilton Tranquility Beach Resort, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. That will add additional rooms yeah. because the demand for Dominica is huge, Mr. Speaker, and growing, Mr. Speaker. One of my biggest problems now is to get more seats, Mr. Speaker. And we're working hard with some airline partners. Well, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to point out something that is happening in Dominica that we don't speak about enough. And Honorable Grant. Um, gave a hint of it, the number of connections because of Airbnb properties, Mr. Speaker. We are doing so well. In 2022, we had 400 Airbnb properties listed. This year, as I speak to you, we have 500, Mr. Speaker, and growing. And when I speak to these property owners, they are always full, Mr. Speaker. They have met me, and some of them don't support the government. But they are saying to me, Minister, we are, your tour, we are doing very well in the tourism industry. Keep up the good work, Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, this is showing to you the investments, ordinary Dominicans, because you know Airbnb, somebody build under their house, so they have their full-time job, and they're making additional income, Mr. Speaker. And you know what the, this brilliant government did in a couple budgets? Remove any taxes on that, Mr. Speaker. They can deduct the interest on it. Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we have, we have made our space very attractive for investments, but investments for ordinary Dominicans, Mr. Speaker, to take advantage of. So, Mr. Speaker, I hope, I'm hoping that by 2024, we'll have over 1,000 hotel rooms. But, Mr. Speaker, there is still more room for expansion. So, I'm putting a call out to Dominicans, Dominican national abroad and investors that Dominica is the hottest island in the region right now and the place to invest, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, some have heeded to the call because we have had, Mr. We have had many investors come and look at the Moroccan Hotel. And Mr. Speaker, I am hoping very soon we'll be able to sign an agreement with a group of Dominican nationals abroad, Mr. Speaker, who want to take over the management of that property, Mr. Speaker. Hats off to them, Mr. Speaker. And that is what we want in this, in this government, for Dominicans to take advantage of the great opportunities in the tourism industry, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the investments in our attractions and events are the lifeblood of, of Dominica's tourism industry, Mr. Speaker. They are the catalysts that draw global attention stimulate our economy and create jobs because that is the metrics we use in tourism mr speaker arrivals spend and how many jobs we can create mr speaker 
Mr. Speaker, Honorable Hippolyte spoke about the importance of community festivals. Well, Mr. Speaker, in tourism, we take a closer look at those who bring in more visitors to the country, Mr. Speaker. Our jazz and Creole music festival, Mr. Speaker, we had a 59% increase in patrons from last year, and we saw increased number of visitors coming to this event, Mr. Speaker. Breakfast fest in Grand Bay, Mr. Speaker. We have partnered with, the, uh, with Mr. Asa, Bandon, Asa Banton, Mr. Speaker, for breakfast fest, because Mr. Speaker, 40 more minutes. Breakfast fest in Grand Bay last year, we had about 900 visitors come to Dominica for breakfast fest. And Mr. Speaker, I was speaking to Asa, and he said to me that all rooms in Grand Bay are booked. He cannot find space to put people in Grand Bay, Mr. Speaker. All this happening, Mr. Speaker, because of the investments you're making in the economy, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, we had the Pace Dominica Yachting Festival in Tukari and, and in Portsmouth, Mr. Speaker. We partnered with, with Pace, which has been there for years, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, we have decided to strengthen that festival. This year, Mr. Speaker, we saw about over 150 yachts registered for that event. We're going to start earlier to promote the invest event, Mr. Speaker, and we hope to see more yachts come to Dominica for the Yachting Festival, Mr. Speaker. The Girodel Eglistel Flower Show, the economic impact of that, Honorable Hippolyte went into detail. And Mr. Speaker, the World Creole Music Festival, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in all our years of hosting the festival, last year was the biggest festival ever, Mr. Speaker, bringing a 10% increase in visitor arrivals in the month of October, Mr. Speaker, and during that period. So, Mr. Speaker, I do not know, I mean, I, I, it's sad, I mean, you cannot find that in the budget estimates, Mr. Speaker, but these things are happening in Dominica. Facts, not fiction, Mr. Speaker, not song bites and fluff. Facts, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, recognizing that Dominica is on the rise and the number of visitors. And, and Mr. Speaker, as I said, during the COVID period, we took a hard look at the industry and see how we could reimage, Mr. Speaker. We changed our marketing strategy, Mr. Speaker. We have gone into pillar strategy on product, which I have mentioned several times in the House. We, go for, we, we are focused on niche marketing. We have aqua tourism, highlighting Dominica's marine life and water-based activities like diving, snorkeling, and kayaking. Agro-tourism, which is an area we have to work more with farmers to, to give them an alternative that apart from the farm, that people can have farm experiences at, at their places. So if, you're, if, you're, if um, the senator father is interested. That's an, another area to make um, additional income, Mr. Speaker. We have adventure, Mr. Speaker. We have the longest hiking trail in the region, Mr. Speaker. Sadly, it was impacted by Hurricane Maria. A lot of segments got damaged and it's not accessible. But as a responsible government, we had to give priority to housing and other needs, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, we received a, a grant and I'm working in the Ministry of Environment, we did an audit of it, and we are going to use that grant funding to make some of the areas that have been cut off accessible, Mr. Speaker. So we have plans to ensure that we restore the glory days of the Whitey Kubuli Trail, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we promote Dominica as a health and wellness destination, Mr. Speaker, focusing on relaxation, rejuvenation, through wellness retreats, spa treatments, Hot springs. We have so many hot springs in Dominica, Mr. Speaker. Not just in Sufrens. Rosa Valley, the hot spring capital. I like to say the health and wellness capital of Dominica, Mr. Speaker. We are, and then we have events and festivals, which I just highlighted some of the festivals. And we also promote the country, inviting people to have conferences, Mr. Speaker. Because one of the things most of the hoteliers have done now is invest in both in conference space, Mr. Speaker. Because one of the challenges we had in hosting conferences, we did not have rooms that would be huge enough to host many people. And I'm happy to say 
that a lot of our hotelians are investing in conference room spaces. But that's another opportunity for investment for Dominicans. You can build a big conference hall like exists in many countries. Mr. Speaker, we spoke about Nicaragua, our heritage, promoting the first people of Dominica, our indigenous people. We have done the assessment on all the sites and attractions in the Kalinago territory, Mr. Speaker, and this year we hope to implement some of our, our projects there, Mr. Speaker. And romance, we're encouraging people to come to Dominica to get married, to celebrate their honeymoon, have family retreats, reunions, and that is what we have to do as a people. For what people enjoy themselves in the Niger Island. Weddings, honeymoons. Mr. Speaker, we are using social media influencers to promote the destination. We've been doing so, Mr. Speaker. And don't talk about sports tourism. People are still amazed that Dominica, Dominica is printed on the shirts of the West in the team of the Niger Sport. What they playing in Trinidad? promoting the beautiful nature island. We didn't pay for that, Mr. Speaker. We could not have paid for those extra days, Mr. Speaker. But they wanted to have that Dominica logo on their t-shirt. Beautiful, Mr. Speaker. Sports tourism. We, we partnered in the major sports netball. And Mr. Speaker, we'll be bringing many more games into Dominica, Mr. Speaker, with our color, color, by collaborating with the Minister of Sports, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and the enhancement, and whilst we are promoting the destination, as I said to you, Mr. Speaker, my, busy, my biggest headache right now is seats. People want to come. Mr. Speaker, I try to find a flight for my niece to leave Dominica. It's a challenge, Mr. Speaker. People want to come to our country. And so we're working hard. We're having conversations with many airline partners to see how we can increase the number of seats coming to, to the country, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, whilst we add that, we recognize that we have to improve our infrastructure. And that is why we are making an investment of $15 million at the Douglas Charles Airport, Mr. Speaker, to extend our runway because we want to sustain the flights that we have. Yes. And Mr. Speaker, whilst we do so, build relationships yes. and have more airline partners Come to Dominica, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, from the time we announced that extension, Mr. Speaker, they have been calling. They have been sending emails and inquiries. Why? Because, Mr. Speaker, you know that the airline is in this industry to make money. They're not coming to Dominica because it's the most beautiful island. They're coming to Dominica because people are demanding, demanding to travel to a destination, Mr. Speaker. And they want to ensure that they can safely bring the people to Dominica, Mr. Speaker. So we are making those investments, and my Honorable Charles, my cousin, explained the importance of that extension for the aviation industry. So I don't need to go into that detail. He already supports the project. And Mr. Speaker, to facilitate travel at our ports, as my Honorable colleague said, we are making an investment in e-gates and kiosks to make it easier for people to come. Right now, Mr. Speaker, once you book your ticket to Dominica, you can go online and fill out your forms, your immigration forms, or your custom form. You can do that immediately. So when you come here, you just show us your code, you scan, and you move on, Mr. Speaker. So we're redu we reducing the wait time in the airport, Mr. Speaker, to make it easier, to facilitate travelers, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, the international airport, Mr. Speaker, who um, Honorable Douglas said we have done no studies. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Dominica Labour Party government is the most responsible government you have ever seen in the history of Dominica, Mr. Speaker. We are all international partners have given us our high commendations for the way we manage the finances of this country, despite all the shocks we face, Mr. Speaker. You really think that the Dominican Labour Party would embark on building an international airport without analyzing the impact, Mr. Speaker? And Mr. Speaker, just in tourism alone, I am telling him I have a problem because I need more airlift into Dominica. And this, the American airline, um, the aircraft, 
although I'm grateful for it, it can only hold 76 people, Mr. Speaker. I need an aircraft landing in Dominica that can hold over 150 people, Mr. Speaker. So I need bigger aircraft to come from different source markets. That alone should justify to you without seeing any paper, data, that more visitors will come once they have access to the country. Honorable Senator Douglas. And that is what we are doing. And the Honorable Minister spoke about the importance for trade. I don't need to go into that detail. He explained how much exports can increase. He was giving me some stats the other day of when we had um, a Marijet coming to Dominica, how much we used to export. So imagine when we have larger aircrafts coming to this country, bringing cargo out, how the GDP of Dominica is going to be. Increase, Mr. Speaker. That is what we are talking about when we talk about the international airport. And it's, it's sad I have to come to this house again to say that. How many times, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, some people I think are just hard of hearing or just plain mischievous to come and say we must justify the importance of an international airport. And Mr. Speaker, one of the things I want the opposition to understand one of the reasons we are in, in, in enhancing our sites is not because of arrival. As I said to you, people are coming here, they're experiencing Dominica, and they love the country. They love our products. But, Mr. Speaker, they are complaining they're not spending enough. They're not spending enough money. For example, if you go to Champagne, you might go there, one day you might pay, one day you might not pay. You understand what I'm saying? But that's a prime product, Mr. Speaker. That's a premium product, Mr. Speaker. So we are going to build a facility at Champagne. So on your board here, you can have some coffee. You can eat, Mr. Speaker. You can even have a, a spa treatment, Mr. Speaker, apart from the tour operators being there offering their services and ensuring that, Mr. Speaker, we have proper facilities, changing rooms, and etc., etc., et Mr. Speaker. We're improving our amenities at those sites, Mr. Speaker. And another thing we are doing, Mr. Speaker, I know the Honorable Hend Senator Henderson Reed spoke about the estimates, but I want them to know that money spent in tourism is really under the recurrent expenses, Mr. Speaker. Just for World Choral Music Festival alone, last year we spent $11 million. And for the capital projects, one of the projects listed there is the port in Antime, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, people have to understand a budget is a plan. It's what we intend to do. But when you are doing things and developing things, this government doesn't rush. We take our time because we want to do it right and we want to do it properly because it's taxpayers' money. It's the people's money. So, Mr. Speaker, we have to do the design, Mr. Speaker. And when we do the design, when we do our um, feasibility studies, Mr. Speaker, after all that, we have to present it. We have to consult with the people, Mr. Speaker. And they have to give an input. And that is what has happened on the, our capital projects. We are allowing people to give their input, Mr. Yes. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, to the point that some of the projects I had listed, we had to revamp everything. We got a group of architects, Mr. Speaker, who said they could help us to build a nice Dominica story. For example, Mr. Speaker, when we enhance Indian River, you're going to hear about the heritage of that site from since 1598. We're working with Dr. Lennox Honey Church. So we decided... We have to stop with this upgrading, Mr. Speaker. Let us just build something new in some areas, but ensuring that it factors in our culture and heritage, that when you come here, you can learn about what Dominica has been, with the history of Dominica, whilst you're going on your tour and enjoying it, Mr. Speaker. So there are a lot of improvements and upgrades we are making, and we have to be realistic with times. We have challenges. Tourism alone cannot take all the money. So, Mr. Speaker, we'll approach it in a very pragmatic manner. We'll do, be able to do one or two this year. Next year, we'll improve another two. And what, by the time you turn your eyes, Mr. Speaker, we'll have more upgraded or renovated or new facilities at our major sites, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Frederick spoke about our intention, Mr. Speaker, to tighten up on collections, Mr. Speaker, because we are making these investments, but we are not collecting sufficient revenue, Mr. Speaker, for maintenance. And so we will be working on a system to make it easy and seamless for you to get your passes to visit sites, Mr. Speaker. But the money will come to the Treasury, Mr. Speaker. 
so we can continue to provide the services as those sites. And Mr. Speaker, we have the Boiling Lake Cable Car Project, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that is the most happening project in the OECS right now, Mr. Speaker. The most talked about project. And I can tell you, the last trade show I went to in Barbados, I was talking to a few colleagues and a few media professionals came here and they said, ministers, no offense, but Dominica is the only island that has come to this conference and has new things happening. We have boiling lake. We have our investment in geothermal, green energy, sustainable um, energy, Mr. Speaker. No other island is talking about that but little Dominica. And they were amazed how our country, which was just hit by Hurricane Maria, could have mm -hmm. such a positive story and making those strides, Mr. Speaker. They were impressed, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. The Boiling Lake, a $54 million project, is expected to be the world's longest cable car. We are building the world's longest cable car to the Boiling Lake, Mr. Speaker. In Dominica, and Mr. Speaker, we hope with that investment and the investment we're going to make in improving our cruise facilities, because we are going to build a cruise village, Mr. Speaker, because the reality is the ships are getting bigger. Um, most um, cruise lines are investing in bigger ships. And if we want to get mega ships, we must improve our facilities. Whilst we maintain what we have to receive the smaller ones, we must make investments to, to um, get more vis visitors, more cruise passengers, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we are hoping if those investments will be able, we are set a target for 1 million cruise visitors, Mr. Speaker, by 2030, Mr. Speaker. And I believe we can achieve it. Mr. Speaker, the vendors are key in the project. We all know the challenges with the Bayfront, Mr. Speaker. And we want to ensure that the, the Bayfront remains beautiful so that every, all users of the Bayfront can enjoy it, Mr. Speaker. And you know, Dominican families like to take their stroll and walk. But Mr. Speaker, we know that during the cruise season, that space is shared with vendors whose livelihoods are dependent to make a, a dollar from selling their tokens and their, um, their, their goods to visitors, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, that Vendors Arcade project has been mentioned, but it's the same thing, Mr. Speaker. We, the government appointed a task force made up of public servants and representatives from the, the, the Vendors Arcade. Vendors, and maybe the but we can see. And Mr. Speaker, we presented them with the designs we had. We got their feedback to say what they like, and they told us, oh, this one too small, this one too big, what they want to see at the Vendors Arcade. And that is how we go about in development. We're consulting people. And sometimes it takes time, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, we are committed to improving our, our our product, Mr. Speaker, and we will, will be making the investment and building the Vendors Arcade so visitors to Dominica can have an improved shopping experience when they come to buy Dominican products. The only thing, Mr. Speaker, I'm asking my vendors, my hardworking vendors, is to sell more authentic Dominican goods, Mr. Speaker. We have a lot of creative people making great products in Dominica, and that is all I want them to do to take a, you know, to advertise and promote more locally made um, um, products, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I spoke about champagne, and I must thank the NEBT, NEP team across the island on the product development. Mr. Speaker, we may think it is irrelevant, but the work the NEP teams are doing in terms of landscaping and beautification is outstanding, Mr. Speaker, and we have to clap for them. Mr. Speaker, it brings me so much joy when I hear visitors speak about the landscaping and the plants when they drive around Dominica, something they don't experience in any other island. And I have to give it, I have to really thank the NEP teams that are working hard to beautify their villages, Mr. Speaker. Because, Mr. Speaker, all our tourism products exist in villages, Mr. Speaker. So we have to ensure from entering a village to exiting, the experience is, non, is, is, is one of the best, Mr. Speaker. The experience of tourists, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, recognizing the importance of the tourism industry and the number of jobs 
that can be created in tourism, Mr. Speaker. We are making investments in our people, training and education, Mr. Speaker. And that is why I really want to thank the Minister of Finance for making the allocation for the Culinary Arts Institute, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have everybody in Dominica claims to be a cook, Mr. Speaker. Our cuisine is top in the region, Mr. Speaker. Some of the best foods you have tasted, Mr. Speaker, are in Dominica, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, we have to move with the times. Some people have different dietary needs, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we have, we have formulated a partnership with the Dominica State College. We have sat with them. We have reviewed their curriculum. I met with the students. We had a wonderful symposium where they shared their ideas and their views. And, Mr. Speaker, we took a detailed look at the present curriculum. And we are working with help, um, chefs, helping chefs, a well-renowned organization that works all over the world. And they have been, they even signed a contract recently with Caribbean Tourism Organization in helping train people in culinary arts, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm looking forward because that is one of, a project, one of the projects that is very dear to my heart, Mr. Speaker. Because even in my constituency, I have many people that love cooking. They love to bake, Mr. Speaker. But what we want to see is that they have certified skill, Mr. Speaker. And what I like about this program, Mr. Speaker, when they are done, we'll have short courses, so we'll have three months, six months courses, and we'll have a two-year associate um, degree, Mr. Speaker. What I love with this program is that at the end of it, they will get a certificate from the American Institute of Culinary Arts, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we are ensuring that our people will be well-skilled to take advantage of the opportunities in the industry. Because I just told you, Tranquility will be opening soon. Marriott Anishi, Sanctuary Eco Resort. I want to make sure people have the first chances at captivating or capturing those jobs, Mr. Speaker. But they'll be able to do so boldly by presenting their certificates, Mr. Speaker. They'll be well trained to serve all dietary needs, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, training is important in our industry. We are, we are doing well so far in terms of customer service, but we have to improve our standards. And that is, that is important for every aspect of the tourism industry. We have to do things better. Viking buy things that for the days gone by. We have to be serious about this industry. It has potential to triple the, its contribution to GDP, Mr. Speaker. But we have to keep our standards high. And that is why we are working with our stakeholders in the industry to ensure that they're well trained, Mr. Speaker, so they can improve their standards. They can dress properly. They can be well groomed, Mr. Speaker. They can know how to talk to visitors. We're also ensuring, Mr. Speaker, that when visitors come, that they can do cashless transactions. So we're working with the National Bank of Dominica, Mr. Speaker, to start a program. We'll first start with taxi operators. So when you come and use a taxi, the taxi operators at the airport, you'll be able to do a cashless transaction. And the thinking and the vision is to include the vendors on the Bayfront as well, Mr. Speaker. All vendors um, in the industry, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Whilst I'm at it, Mr. Speaker, I hope to meet with NBD. Because one of the biggest complaints in our industry is that visitors come here. They want to spend money. And when they go to the ATM machine, they cannot withdraw money. They cannot use their card. And it bothers me, Mr. Speaker, because I don't want us to lose foreign exchange. So I'll be meeting with the management of the National Bank to find out what are the issues in the, what an issue and what we can do to solve this problem. Because it's a serious one, Mr. Speaker. You have accommodation holders who people come and sometimes they cannot swipe their card. So that is a challenge we have to overcome, Mr. Speaker. But other than that, Mr. Speaker, the industry is doing very well, Mr. Speaker. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, it's important knowing the opportunities and the money people can make additional form of income, Mr. Speaker. You can make by investing in the tourism industry. As I said, you can have your full-time job. You can, right now, Mr. Speaker, we have a demand for dive operators. All the dive operators in Dominica are booked during the cruise yes. season. There are people wanting to go on snorkeling tours, and they cannot go, Mr. Speaker. They are sold out. The tours are sold out because we do not have sufficient dive operators. So, Mr. Speaker, we need some young people to... In, to Get trained in that industry. 
Uh, recently, we held a training to train a few of them, Mr. Speaker. But we need more because there are opportunities there. Just in being a dive operator and bringing a group of people for snorkeling, Mr. Speaker, there's money to be made in Dominica, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, in industry is doing very well. And that is why in the National Reset, Mr. Speaker, as I have shown you, that we have done a lot with the funds we have been allocated, Mr. Speaker. It's not just about money and spending money over it. It's being strategic, Mr. Speaker. And that is what we've done in the tourism industry. We're very st strategic, Mr. Speaker. And we will continue on that path, Mr. Speaker, because we are in uncertain times, Mr. Speaker. And we have to be wise about that, Mr. Speaker. So even if I want all the money for marketing yeah. and to the capital projects, Mr. Speaker, I have to be cognizant of the fact that these are uncertain times. We have a war ongoing. We don't know when it's going to end. Five more minutes. Ten, ten minutes. Sure. Sure. Mr. Speaker, I move that the Member of Parliament from Sufria constituency be given an additional ten minutes to complete. So, Mr. Speaker, it, has, it has been moved and seconded that the Honorable Minister be given an additional 10 minutes. Those in favor? Those against? The eyes have it. Honorable Minister, you are given an additional 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there is so much happening in the tourism industry. But, um, you know, I'm try I was trying to stick to my time, but it, it's, it, it's, it's a lot, Mr. Speaker happening in tourism in Dominica right now, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, in this national reset, as I was saying, we are going to be smarter with our funds, Mr. Speaker, and to get more value for our money. And we launched a campaign in our nature, Mr. Speaker, which did very well for Dominica right after just in 2020, 2021, we launched that campaign. It did very well. And we're planning to launch a new campaign soon. I can't share those details in the halls because, as I said, it's a competitive industry, but it's promising to be a very exciting campaign to promote what is distinctly Dominica, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to say that the work we are doing today in the industry is not just for us, but for future generations. We are building a sustainable, resilient, and vibrant tourism sector that will continue to drive economic growth create jobs, and showcase the unique beauty and culture of Dominica to the world, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our journey is not without challenges, but with determination, with unity, with the creativity of our people, and a clear vision, we will overcome the obstacles that we face in industry and we face in the country on a whole, Mr. Speaker. And what I want to encourage our people is that if you're not in the tourism industry, now is your time to invest. Take advantage of the $12 million left at the aid bank, Mr. Speaker, because I'm saying to you, as I mentioned before, in Jamaica, what they have a fight, two roosters fighting, Mr. Speaker, and that is one of the hottest things they have, products they have in Jamaica. You understand? I'm just saying that about Jamaica. I am saying... It is so easy to make an investment in the tourism industry. And as we can see from the data I presented, it is one of the fastest rebounding industries. So you cannot go wrong in the tourism industry, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, I think I have shared enough information. So those who were not well informed, I believe that they took notes. And they are well informed now, Mr. Speaker. I wanted to let them know that the Ministry of Tourism Office is always open. All the data I presented cannot be found in the estimates, but we can share it with the Minister and the Ministry of Tourism. Mr. Speaker, but I want to move on to my constituency, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Sufre constituency is going to be the tourism mecca of Dominica. I have declared that several times, Mr. Speaker, and it is happening, Mr. Speaker. One of the products mentioned in Times Magazine is the Whitey Kubuli Sea Trail that is resident and homegrown in the Sufra constituency, Mr. Speaker. 
And Mr. Speaker, we'll be making investments in Scotshead. Um, people just naturally love to come to Scotshead every weekend. That is why I always talk to my NEP teams to keep the beach clean. Naturally, Mr. Speaker, every weekend we have people in Supra and Scotshead. We'll be enhancing the peninsula. The plan, we had a design. I got some feedback from some stakeholders. We went back to the drawing board to enhance the design, Mr. Speaker, and hopefully in a month I will present the new designs to them, and then from there, we will, from there, Mr. Speaker, we'll progress with the project, Mr. Speaker. We also, Mr. Speaker, were able, and with the help of one of my constituents, who I think he would not, be, um, he would not mind if I call his name in the Honorable House, um, Mr. Florian Michel, who is the um, General Manager of Solid Waste, he works very well with Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, we haven't sat and just done nothing, Mr. Speaker. We recognize the time, Mr. Speaker, but there's a lot of grant money available, Mr. Speaker, to pursue some projects. So we submitted a project for the alum stream, Mr. Speaker. As we speak about the blue economy, we have alum stream, the water going into the sea, and we want to tackle that, Mr. Speaker. And so we submitted a project to do so. And I must say this project was successful, it was approved. So hopefully we have an allocation of 300,000 euros to tackle that project, Mr. Speaker. And there is also a livelihood component of that project which will allow us to start the rehabilitation of the Sulphur Springs in Sufre, Mr. Speaker. So Mr. Speaker, when I say to you that we are going to be the Mecca, it's not just words, it's action, Mr. Speaker. We're making the right investments. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to inform my officials. I know they were happy to hear Honorable um, Defo, Mr. Speaker, because Mr. Speaker has some officials that have been waiting a long time for their boats. And when he explained, to, 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 when he explained about the, the boats will soon be ready and how strong the boats are, Mr. Speaker, I was impressed, Mr. Speaker. So I know the officials from my constituency who receive these boats will be very happy, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, their wait was not in vain, Mr. Speaker. Promise made, promise kept. They will get their votes, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, he also spoke about the landing sites we we'll are doing in Sufre and Scotland, Mr. Speaker. That was something that, in, in conversation with the officials, that was needed, Mr. Speaker. The last landing site was destroyed in Scotland by Hurricane Maria. Sufre never had one, but Scotland did. And I'm happy that in this budget, we'll have two landing sites. One in, Sufre, one in Sufre and one in Scotland, Mr. Speaker. And there are all also plans to improve the locker rooms for the fishers, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, another project dear to my heart, recognizing that I come from a fishing community, is the fishing processing plant that we'll be doing. And a contract has been awarded, Mr. Speaker. We are finalizing the designs of that facility. So I'm hoping very soon, Mr. Speaker, that we'll go to the next phase which is construction phase, Mr. Speaker. But that is a project that will transform the lives of ordinary fisher folks and fishmongers in the Sufra constituency. Mr. Mr. Speaker, on the sports, we have made advancements. You know, it, it, I had started a project to build a multi-purpose court in Point Michel because we have a big project in Point Michel to upgrade and expand our playing field. And it's a project that we hope that um, the FIFA will assist with, Mr. Speaker. But to start the process, one of the key things was to relocate the multi-purpose court that we have, which was in terrible state anyways, Mr. Speaker. It was in a deplorable state. And Mr. Speaker, I am happy that with the help, with good partners and with some grants and the government, we have completed the multi-purpose court in, Dom in Point Michel and it will soon be officially open, Mr. Speaker. But it's in use by, by our sportsmen, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I have also upgraded the multi-purpose court in Sufre, which I met with about 15 basketball players. And they said to me, Parep, I know these are challenging times. I know we asked you for a new multi-purpose court, but if you just upgrade the facility we are using, we'll give you a break power. Because we know you have many things to deal with, especially in housing. And Mr. Speaker, I, I was happy for the support of the government and public works, Mr. Speaker, I upgraded that facility for them. So the Dennis Charles Seahawks will have no excuse but to bring the trophy home next um, basketball season, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, you know, I was a 
um, sports. I, I used to play volleyball. I love sports, Mr. Speaker. So I have invested in a lot of sporting teams. You know, Paul and Michelle have one of the strongest football teams in Dominica, Mr. Speaker. I want to, I, you know, I, 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 I know honorable people it will challenge me, Mr. Speaker. But when you talk about sport, football, Mr. Speaker, the first um, village you think about is Paul and Michelle, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and so I've invested in a lot of sporting teams and even in volleyball, Mr. Speaker, I want more of our young people to get involved in the sport of volleyball. I used to play volleyball. And so, Mr. Speaker, I have partnered with a group of young men, Mr. Speaker, and we have opened the Dennis Charles R&D Volleyball Academy, Mr. Speaker. So, more people from the Sufra constituency will be playing, um, will be interested and be trained in, in volleyball, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, things are happening in Sufra constituency, and I didn't talk about housing, Mr. Speaker. I just posted a reel on Facebook, Mr. Speaker, of the amazing work happening in Scott said, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, all of these homes are being built by local contractors, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, when you look at the workmanship, I am so proud as the parent to visit those homes. I passed the other day and the apartment building is at an advanced stage, Mr. Speaker. And my boys are up there and tell me, yes, parent. And I really want to tell them I am proud of them. The workmanship they are showing, the discipline, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we can have a better standard of living for people, Mr. Speaker, given that a lot of them have been waiting since Hurricane Maria. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm hoping soon to get my keys to my apartment buildings and new homes in Scott said and in Point Michel, Mr. Speaker. Another example of how the government is empowering local contractors. Every home in my constituency is being built by local contractors, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, one of the areas, though, that I am going to focus on this year is in training and development. I think it is very important for people to be prepared and position themselves to take advantage of opportunities. We have a lot of people in my constituency that have been involved in fishing and sports, but I want them to open their mind to other possibilities. That is why even at a primary school level, at the summer school programs I have, I, I introduce them to other careers, Mr. Speaker. We have people from the avian, avi aviation industry talking to them. We have lawyers. I'm teaching them about their civic responsibility because I want them to know there is no free lunch, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, whilst I am on there, I must respond to Honorable Senator Henderson Reed, who tried to say that this government, I don't know how that slipped me, is trying to take money from poor people by a little fee we impose on credit union, unions, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that one thing, I don't know if Dominicans live in a, some Dominicans, some of them live in a vacuum, and they're not aware of what is happening around the world with dairy skin and fat F. We didn't impose those things, you know. These are things that have been imposed on us, and we have to comply. Because if we don't comply, we'll be blacklisted, and they will be the first to come in the house and boast how Dominica has been blacklisted, Mr. Speaker, like you're boasting about the so, Mr. Speaker, these are, times have changed. When the credit union first started, the credit union started as a Malawi bank. Now they have credit cards. They have expanded their services. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, they have money grants. Mr. Speaker, this is not the little credit union that started 20 years ago. So I, I, I don't understand. And Mr. Speaker, the last I checked, the net surplus, surplus of the credit union was 6 million EC dollars. Yeah. And so the credit union that has six, six million surplus, that's why I said the surplus of six million. Six million surplus. We're not talking about their one billion dollar assets. Six million surplus. That means net. Mr. Speaker, when I calculated the hundred thousand dollars the senator talking about, which is not on saving, it just is 0.01 percent of the surplus, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let's be real in this country. You're talking about growth and advancement. I mean, don't come here and try to say we put a tax on power, money, with money. Come on, and we're proud of the credit union, that they have grown and expanded and behaving just like a bank. The NBD pays over $200,000 in fees. So we have to be responsible about our statements, Mr. Speaker. I know we want to sound right, but as I say, let us do research, Mr. Speaker. 
And before we make points, let us understand the point you are making. 0.01% on 6 million surplus we are talking about. Let's be serious, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, I was on the Sufra constituency. That's what they do. They come here and mislead the Dominican public. And that's why I had to correct yeah, that two, misinformation. Two more minutes. But Mr. Speaker, Dominica is on the right track. We are, we are building a sustainable economy by the investments we are making, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister brilliantly, as I said, re-engineered the CBI pro um, program that we recognize early o'clock that we never know what will happen in the CBI in the future. That's not no secret. We knew that, Mr. Speaker, things can change at any time, Mr. Speaker, just like the preferential treatment we had on Van Allen. Things can change at any time. We prepared for it. And that is why we made investments in the hotel industry, Mr. Speaker. That is why we improve our roads, Mr. Speaker. And that is why we're making great investment in agriculture and the digital economy is to get our people to be more productive, to take advantage of the new opportunities available to them in dynamic Dominica, Mr. Speaker. So what we need now more than ever is not to throw little punches behind the after each other. This is one Dominica, one Dominica. We rise together, we fall together. So what we have to do, recognizing the investments and the monies available to Dominicans to invest in their country, is work together, Mr. Speaker. Have a united voice on the development and progress of our country. That is what is needed. Change our mindsets. The same people that come here, Mr. Speaker, criticizing us, they come with a list asking for things at the same time. But Mr. Speaker, we have proven that we're a responsible government and we'll continue to be a responsible government. That is why the Dominican people will always vote for the Dominica Labour Party government. We are the only government that truly cares about the ordinary people and ordinary lives and livelihoods in Dominica. And we commit to the Dominican people that under this Labour Party was the Dominican children, the youth of Dominica, will realize their dreams, Mr. Speaker, and we will not go to IMF like some of them wishing, Mr. Speaker, it will not happen yeah. under the watch of the Dominica Labour Party government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Senator Edwards, I recognize you. You may proceed. Mr. Speaker, good afternoon. I rise to give my support to this budget, 2023-2024, as was presented by my friend and colleague, Dr. Levin McIntyre. Mr. Speaker, when I listened to, to the budget, I read it, I have heard my colleagues speak, and I know this budget is a budget of the people, because it was made for the people by the Dominican Labour Party. And this budget was not compiled in a vaiki vai manner, because I'm aware of the fact that the Minister for Finance right, right. <laughs> the Minister for Finance did consult with a wide cross section of the, of the Dominican public before he put this budget together. There were consultations on a weekly basis. When you ask for Dr. McIntyre, he's meeting with this group. He met with that group and other groups in Dominica. So I am quite sure that some of the things in the budget are the ideas that he got from the public. Because this government is not in the habit of doing things and throwing it down people's throat. We always consult with our constituents at constituency level, at national level. We consult with stakeholders before we compile what we compile to bring to them. So this budget is a, is a budget that I know that will be implemented and will help the Dominican people. It is a budget that is therefore every sphere of the community, agriculture, education, fisheries, just name it, and this budget will be part of, is part of that budget. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Health has come under some scrutiny 
from the other side. I heard them. But we must remember that the same Ministry of Health that people thought could not deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. And everybody came back to this honorable house and commended the Ministry of Health for taking care of the pandemic. So rest assured that the Ministry of Health is going to solve the issues because the Minister for Health and his team work night and day, every day, to take care of the health issues in Dominica. Mr. Speaker, we know for a fact that the world is now being confronted by a pandemic of NCDs. NCDs is not only an issue in the Caribbean or Dominica, it's an issue worldwide. And the problem, or should I say, the slight difficulty with NCDs, they are lifestyle diseases. So it is not easy to impose restrictions on people's lifestyles. So it will always be a little more difficult to fight NCDs. You can only do it with education, with motivation, and to be at people's head and ponging them with a bliss of information over and over. Because diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, heart disease, obesity, just name it. These are things that we know that people control themselves. And you could come to the health centers, you could access all the hospital that is available to you, all the health centers, all the healthcare professionals. But at the end of the day, is the individual themselves that to go back home and to do what was said to them to do. And we recognize that. Hence, a coordinator for NCDs was hired last year with the sole purpose of fighting this pandemic because we recognize at the ministry level that it is a problem. We are not shy away from that. That's a fact. We know it's a problem. That is why a coordinator, Dr. Andy Sentile, was hired last year, and his job is to work in the districts, work with the health districts, work with the director of primary health care and the primary health care department to go out and sell the information, educate the people, and put things in place to fight this pandemic. And we are asking the people of Dominica from this house and from my side and the Ministry of Health to help the ministry to help that pandemic, to help you. Because at the end of the day, as I said earlier on, you could come to the health centers, you could check your blood pressure, and you could be diagnosed as hypertensive. And when you return, you don't take your tablets, you eat salty foods, you don't exercise, you, 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 you drink excessively, and you do all the excesses, and at the end of the day, it comes to zero. So the public have to work with the director of primary health care, the health teams, the Ministry of Health, the head of NCDs that was put in place specifically for that to deal with this. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Health is a forward-thinking ministry. We have been seeing that people from Dominica have been accessing health care externally for a long period. Hence, the government has decided to upgrade and augment our hospital so that the people of Dominica will no longer have to travel overseas to access health care. This is why we are in the process at the ministry of putting things in place at the hospital, putting machinery in place so that in the future and very soon, and probably even now, people won't be going to access all health care overseas. And at the hospital level, we are working night and day to make sure these things happen. Because when you have someone who is supposed to be doing some investigations and they have to travel to a neighboring island, of course, it is an expense, it is inconvenience, it is everything that you don't want. Obviously, in the past, they were not available in Dominica, but the government has made sure that there is a CT scan machine at the hospital, there is high food at the hospital, and there is an eye clinic that is second to none in the Caribbean. This is the Brenda Strafford Eye Clinic, and there was at one point an eye system, eye clinic in Dominica that the people would come to Roseau, but right and truly it was not as well equipped. The government has gone out 
and has partnered with the Brenda Stratford Foundation. And now there is a state-of-the-art eye clinic. So people from Dominica and externally, overseas, can access this eye clinic in Dominica now. And if this is not good health care, I don't know what is. Because it is always health. It's always a work in progress. There's always room to improve. We are not saying that we should not improve. But if things are working well, we should admit. Because during the COVID-19 pandemic, sir, and Mr. Speaker, Dominica was the first country, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. McIntyre, to do testing. Everybody else went to CAFA whilst we had our machine to do our COVID-19 test right here in Dominica. And nobody acknowledged that. Now, not only that, not only that, Dr. Mack, you could correct me if I'm wrong as well. We were the first country to receive vaccines during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have in Dominica a cadre of specialists that was sent out by this government to specialize in various fields. Orthopedists, gynecologists, psychiatrists, you name it, and we have it. And there's more to come. And in the very near future, we will have enough specialists at our hospital, Dominica Child Defensive Hospital, to help our Dominicans without importing that. And Dominica government is putting resources in its young people to come and specialize, come to Dominica, study a medicine, and then go back, get specialized. Here is Dr. Williams, my pal rep. She's a pediatrician who went overseas to specialize. And she's here in Dominica. And she's in the House of Assembly now, and there's another pediatrician at the hospital, as we speak now. So even if she's there now, we still have another one to continue what she started. And we, at the Ministry of Health, have been looking into everything, everything to do with health. And we have been partnering with some foreign agencies. We know of the World Pediatric Program. Dr. Williams, isn't that so? Yes, yes the World Pediatric Program, we are... People, young people that are challenged with diseases of the heart and other congenital diseases are sent overseas to access medication. I am here as well. I know of some people myself who was sent there at the age of one year, two years, three years, and corrective measures were taken, and they are now living normal life. And the government of Dominica is continuing this program with the World Pediatric Program. So... It is not like everything is, is doom and gloom, like it's being portrayed by some people. Because, be, be, because we have to understand that the world dynamic has changed when it comes to health. In the 1940s, 1930s, it was infectious diseases that were really the problem. Typhoid and, and, and tuberculosis. And, but things have changed now. And these things are easier to control anyway, because these are vectors and you could kill the mosquitoes and stop the dengue. But when you deal with NCDs, like I said before, is lifestyle diseases. And we need the public to buy into that. We need the public to admit that it is a lifestyle thing. And we have to help the ministry to help ourselves to fight this pandemic. And we have added mental health as part of the NCDs as well. Because mental health is really an NCD. And we have added mental health. Recently, PAHO had partnered with the government to put some measures in place to include mental health on the NCDs agenda, and the director for NCDs will be called in the districts and everywhere else, because what is important is to do it at the primary health care level, to avoid the people from being hospitalized. So we are going to be teaching prevention, preaching prevention, and practicing prevention in the coming months. We are going to do that. The infrastructure, as we know, is in place. Health centers were built in many communities in Dominica. Many, many health centers were built in Dominica. And the infrastructure is in place. Now is the personnel and the community to work together to access these health centers. The people of Dominica are aware of the infrastructure in place. What we need to do is to access it. You feel, you wake up this morning, you don't have to feel sick to go to the health center. You could do it as a routine. Just go to the health center and ask the nurse to check your blood pressure for you, check your blood sugar, because many people have got yourself, gotten yourself diagnosed just by doing a routine check. Because as we know, not many, all, most of the diseases have no symptoms. So it is very important that we do 
we use the infrastructure that was put in place and equipment because these health centers, I have visited them, they are all outfitted with equipment that we can use to diagnose our people in the districts. And we need the primary health care system to continue doing what it's doing to avoid our people from getting sick and getting to the hospital. The Honorable Minister for Health, of course, will elaborate on most of the things that I've already said when he comes. But I have to say that I have been listening over the past days about the kind of attack or the kind of scrutiny, to put it nicely, that the Ministry of Health is, is, is being placed under. And rightly, if there are things to be done, you should always highlight them, and they will be done. But it should not be sent out there that the Ministry of Health is doom and gloom. Government of Dominica has put one of the best health systems in the Caribbean, in Dominica, for sure. That's a fact. And we are going to continue to improve on these things. We are going to continue to improve on it. And this budget that we are responding to now has spoken about it, and there are some items that are not in the budget that will be done by the Ministry of Health in this coming financial year. So I am just starting to give my brief contribution and my whole support to this budget of 2023-2024. Mr. Speaker, thanks for the, for the opportunity and I support the budget. Yes, uh, Senator Rule. I, I recognize you here. You can proceed. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this evening I rise in total support of this 2023-2024 budget put before this Honorable House. And Mr. Speaker, before I begin my presentation, you know, for the last few days I've been listening to the opposition, listening to what they're saying and, you know, everything that they're not saying. And one thing that struck out to me is that time and time again, you hear them asking questions about this and that. But this is our third sitting of parliament, and not once have they came to this honorable house and asked a formal question for you, the speaker, Mr. For you, Mr. Speaker. And what that tells me is that they are not interested in the truth. They don't want the answers. All they want to do is come and try to make these accusations and cast aspersions to, to try to bring down our country, Mr. Speaker. And if they were serious, and if they were trying to really be a parliamentary opposition, they would take that route. Also, Mr. Speaker, when we say something doesn't tell the whole story, or is telling a different story, we must read more than just one page of the book, Mr. Speaker. And I say that to say that last week, Senator Paris made a statement that um, our, PSIP, our PSIP budget allocation for the Ministry of Agriculture had went down from, I believe it was 8.27% to 6.77%. But what he did not tell us is that that allocation is actually more than it was in the last budgetary year. So you're saying these things. You are not looking at the entire picture, and you're trying to mislead the people of Dominica. And that, Mr. Speaker, should be frowned upon. But let me go into my, my presentation, Mr. Speaker. I wish to firstly applaud the Honorable Minister for Finance unreservedly for a visionary, transformational, strategic, and timely budget. Mr. Speaker, before I continue, please, um, I wish to ask for your permission to refer to my notes. Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I consider this year's budget to be another critical milestone on our developmental path as we continue to navigate through these unprecedented times, Mr. Speaker, brought on by the Ukraine and, and Russia war, as well as other external shocks. Mr. Speaker, this budget has been crafted against a but, uh, backdrop of a world that is severely challenged. Small island developing states like ours are among the most vulnerable countries and are heavily impacted by external shocks. In the face of these current global economic challenges, 
I rise before this honorable house to commend the resilience and determination of our Prime Minister, Honorable Dr. Roosevelt Skerritt, and this Dominica Labour Party administration. Despite the turbulent state of economic affairs on the global stage, this government has steadfastly upheld a commitment to the people of Dominica and has continued to steer our nation towards progress and prosperity. Mr. Speaker, I feel duty-bound to highlight the unwavering stability that this government has maintained during these trying times. Our prudent financial management and strategic policy decisions have shielded Dominica from the worst effects of external economic fluctuations. While others may have faltered, we stood strong, safeguarding the interests of our citizens and laying the groundwork for a more resilient nation. Mr. Speaker, this Labour Party administration has proven its dedication to Dominica's development agenda and has done so while being mindful of the need for fiscal responsibility. Every step is carefully considered with the ultimate goal of empowering the citizens of our nation and uplifting our nation, Mr. Speaker. Even in these challenging times, this government has upheld the functioning of all government social safety net programs. Mr. Speaker, this speaks to our government's compassion and total support for the most in need. Truly, the continuity and functionality of these social safety net programs in the face of global economic challenges are commendable. This, demonstrate, this demonstrates a special kind of love and commitment to the people of Dominica that should never be taken for granted. Mr. Speaker, when times are tough, Dominicans must pay close attention to who is in their corner. And make no mistake about it, Mr. Speaker, our Prime Minister and this Dominican Labour Party administration stands firmly in the corner of the people of Dominica, Mr. Speaker. Amidst the uncertainties and hardships faced by nations worldwide, we must take pride in the fact that our government has not wavered in its commitment to progress. We have, without compromise, pursued a comprehensive development agenda that puts Dominica and its people at the forefront. One need not look too far to see the tangible evidence of our, our unwavering dedication to the development of Dominica across all sectors. From the massive road project in the east, the construction of numerous top-class hotels across Dominica, the upgrading of several tourism sites, the state-of-the-art regional emergency shelters in Jimmet and Cassibros, and Mr. Speaker, the list goes on and on. The construction of numerous roads across the island stands as a testament to our commitment to improving connectivity and accessibility for all Dominicans. Mr. Speaker, when I, when I sit on my porch, I, I see the recently constructed stretch of road between the Hillsborough Bridge and the York Valley Bridge. And just to support Honorable Lloyd, I believe, yes, that's the best road in Dominica right now. I know some of my colleagues may disagree. <laughs> but, Mr. Speaker, the benefits of this road project has already began to manifest particularly the enhanced access to the Lai River, especially during those hot summer days that we experienced in May. Mr. Speaker, and, and don't even talk about when Doasco takes water. Mr. Speaker, it's down to Lai River, we must go. But on a, on a more serious note, the improved road conditions have also been of benefit to both farmers and top to operators as well as other stakeholders who traverse the road frequently. I know for a fact that the Waki Rollers team from Laiu and Senjo are very happy for the new road and the increased work that will come on the river. And Mr. Speaker, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the, the parliamentary representative for the St. Joseph constituency in seeing the successful completion 
of this much needed project in his constituency. Mr. Speaker, I want to take some time, as I always do, to highlight some of the projects and programs that the youth of Dominica can benefit from. Now, I debated whether or not I was going to take this angle, but I felt compelled to do so in response to the question, what is in the budget for you? And Mr. Speaker, the simple answer to that is more things than time permits me to tell. But I will start with the International Airport. Yes, Mr. Speaker, the International Airport is on. What a time to be alive, Mr. Speaker. I think I speak for the large majority of Dominicans when I say that it is a pleasure to traverse through the community of Wesley to see such visible progress towards the attainment of such a project. The International Airport development is not just a mere infrastructure project. It is a transformative undertaking that will propel our nation to new horizons of development, connectivity, and economic growth. The visionary step towards the development of, Dom of this international airport will have a huge impact on our people. And for me, Mr. Speaker, it's crucial to highlight the tangible benefits that this massive project will bring especially for our young people. And Mr. Speaker, I want the young people of Dominica to know that sometimes, you know, the titles of projects don't have to read youth in international development, international airport development, for us to recognize that there are massive, massive opportunities for our youth. First and foremost, Mr. Speaker, the construction of our international airport will create a plethora of employment opportunities for our population. With the construction phase ongoing and not yet in full swing, we are already experiencing an upsurge in the demand for skilled labor, heavy machine operators, engineers, lab technicians, and various other professions. Indeed, our youth will be at the forefront of this workforce gaining valuable experiences and skills that will bolster their career prospects in the future. Beyond the construction phase, Mr. Speaker, Dynamic Dominica's international airport will undoubtedly open up new avenues for economic diversification. Upon the completion of the airport, our nation will witness an influx of tourists, investors, and businesses. This surge in economic activity will create a demand for hospitality services, tourism-related industries, and small businesses, allowing for our youth to unleash their entrepreneurial spirit and play a vital role in the expansion of our economy. And Mr. Speaker, you know, we talk about opportunities, but just permit me to give a few, you know, concrete examples of some of the opportunities that I'm talking about. I'm talking about tour guiding and tour companies, Mr. Speaker. Airport mobile development, mobile app development, Mr. Speaker. Laundry services for the many Airbnbs that are being talked about, Mr. Speaker. Housekeeping services for these very same Airbnbs. Airport shuttle services. And, Mr. Speaker, you know that we are going green. So opportunities may very well exist for uh, electric vehicle fleet, Mr. Speaker. Now, ultimately, Mr. Speaker, my hope is that such a development will instill in our youth a sense of pride and purpose. Witnessing the transformation of our beautiful nation through such a tangible achievement will inspire them to dream big and aim high. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to small business development. The decision to allocate approximately $8 million to support small businesses in our country is testament to our government's foresight and commitment to nurturing economic resilience. Over the years, we have witnessed a remarkable surge in new businesses across various sectors. And Mr. Speaker, I mean, even a brief glance through WhatsApp, WhatsApp statuses, Mr. Speaker, 
you see a number of small businesses popping up across everybody's phone. And I, I think I speak for, I think the, the entire house can attest to this. This entrepreneurial surge is not by chance, Mr. Speaker, but as a result of the deliberate policies and support mechanisms put in place by this government to encourage and empower our citizens to pursue their dreams of business ownership. I speak to the legislative intervention such as the removal of VAT and import duties on packaging and labeling equipment, as well as equipment and machinery used for the production of goods. This, coupled with the provision of access to finance through the $27.8 million loan facility at the aid bank, have undoubtedly supported an enabling environment for the production of quality goods and services on Ireland. In my view, Mr. Speaker, the manifestation of such an intervention was on full display at the Ministry of Labor's Health and Wellness Trade Show. And I wish, I wish to place on record my commendation to the Ministry for organizing such a successful event. Mr. Speaker, I, I had the privilege of attending, and I was deeply impressed by the diversity and the quality of products and services on display, from oils to honey to candles to soap, just to name a few. And all of them were well packaged to international standard, Mr. Speaker. The Health and Wellness Trade Show showcased an impressive array of local products and services, underscoring the immense talent, creativity, and innovation within our small business sector. It truly exemplified that the entrepreneurial spirit thrives within our communities, Mr. Speaker. And the allocation of $8 million in this current budget will amplify this trend and create an environment conducive to innovation, econ economic diversification, and job creation. And Mr. Speaker, while on the topic of facilitating a conducive MSME environment, please permit me to commend our Honorable Minister for Finance for taking a strategic approach to ensure that the burdens of progress do not fall upon the small business sector and the end consumers. I listened attentively to the budget address last Tuesday, and I must make mention of the fact that not one of these new licenses and levies to be imposed will directly affect the small business sector, nor will they burden our cherished consumers. It is clear to me that this administration has diligently analyzed and assessed the potential impact of these measures, bearing in mind the pivotal role of the MSME sector in our society. By doing so, Mr. Speaker, we are ensuring that the entrepreneurial spirit... 15 more minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are ensuring that the entrepreneurial spirit remains vibrant and our MSMEs can continue to flourish in a nurturing and conducive environment. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to youth in entrepreneurship. And by now, Mr. Speaker, you would know that, you know, I'm very passionate about the development of youth entrepreneurship. I firmly believe that it is a key pil pillar to the attainment of our dynamic Dominica. Having trained well over 1,500 young entrepreneurs and swiftly approaching its 20th year of existence, the Dominica Youth Business Trust has solidified itself as a pivotal platform for the nurturing and support of youth entrepreneurship in Dominica. Just this past fiscal year, the Trust can proudly boast of several achievements, including the training of over 70 budding and existing entrepreneurs, a total of 68 business, plan, business plans reviewed by technical staff, grants disbursed to 20 entrepreneurs in excess of $60,000, and also the hosting of a small business X1 Fund on the southeast 
which saw over 20 entrepreneurs spanning from Grand Four to Dailies setting up shop on the La Plain playing field to show not just the district, but Dominica, what they had to offer, Mr. Speaker. And I must thank our partner, Ms. Shirley Vigilant of Divine Elegance Craft and Print Shop. I also wish to express my thanks once again to Honorable Dr. Williams and Honorable Greta Roberts for their support in this activity, as well as thank the staff of the Dominica Youth Business Trust for their unwavering support to all of our entrepreneurs. This $200,000 budget allocation will most certainly strengthen the activities of the trust and ensure that more young Dominicans have an opportunity to benefit from such a program. By allocating these funds, Mr. Speaker, this government is sending a strong message that we believe in our young people and their ability to drive positive change in our society, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I now turn to the digital economy. At the heart of this budget lies the recognition that the digital age is upon us. And embracing it is not a luxury, but an imperative for the progress of our nation. As the world becomes increasingly interconnected and technology driven, investing in the digital economy is not just a prudent choice, but it is an essential investment in the future of Dominica. This year's budget allocation of $16 million towards the operationalization, that would that still get me, of the digital economy in Dominica in this year's budget is a transformative investment for our youth and the future of our nation. This is why I must commend this Dominica Labour Party administration for the vision to establish 15 innovation hubs across Dominica. These hubs are dynamic and fertile grounds for our youth to cultivate their digital skills and unleash their creativity. As we speak, Mr. Speaker, workshops are ongoing in programming and web design in these spaces. And through these programs, we are ensuring that our youth will not just be passive consumers of technology, spending countless hours on TikTok and YouTube and I think right now is Monopoly Go, but active creators and problem solvers, Mr. Speaker. By learning programming and web design, they are gaining the ability to build applications websites, and software solutions. This newfound creativity can translate into entrepreneurship and innovation, allowing them to contribute to the growth of our economy and create businesses that cater to both the local and global markets. The innovation hubs are strategically placed across the country and will serve as beacons of progress and empowerment. The training modules, more importantly, offered within those four walls will inspire young minds to dream big, regardless of their location or background. And speaking about entrepreneurship, Mr. Speaker, the provision of grants of up to $27,000, as articulated by the Honorable Minister for Finance, to support digital technology is also a monumental step towards encouraging entrepreneurship, empowering startups, and promoting digi digital inclusion among our people. These grants will serve as a catalyst for fresh ideas and innovative projects, providing aspiring entrepreneurs with the necessary resources to turn their dreams into reality. Not only will these grants enable the establishment of new ventures, but they will also fortify the existing business in their digital transformation journey. Embracing technology will allow our industries to become more efficient, competitive, and globally connected, positioning them, positioning Dominica as a hub for digital excellence in the Caribbean region. 
And Mr. Speaker, you know, you can't talk about the digital economy without talking about the massive success that is the Work Online Dominica program. With 180 Dominicans already trained, and an additional 60 will soon be equipped with this valuable skill, there is no doubt that this program is a remarkable achievement. In my view, Mr. Speaker, I, I think this was probably the start of the reset, Mr. Speaker. The Work Online Dominica program is a game changer for our country, providing a gateway to the digital realm and empowering our citizens with tools to thrive in the ever-evolving global job market. In a world where technology has become an inseparable part of our lives, the ability to work online opens a world of opportunities for personal growth, economic empowerment, and national development. The benefits of the Work Online program extend far beyond, the con beyond convenience and flexibility. For small island developing states like Dominica, this program represents a huge milestone in our quest for sustainable development. Our economy has historically been reliant on traditional sectors, such as agriculture and tourism. Now, while these sectors remain a vital part of our nation's prosperity, the Work Online Dominica program introduces a new frontier of economic diversification and resilience. And with these strategic, sustained, and intentional actions towards making inroads in the digital economy, you know, it's very likely that Dominica is, if not already, will be a model for the Eastern Caribbean. And who knows, we could very well be the next Estonia of the Caribbean region, Mr. Speaker. I now want to move on to the future housing project. Mr. Speaker, we all know that one of the most significant challenges faced by young Dominicans is a steep climb towards home ownership. Lucky for us, our Labour Party government recognizes the importance of providing youth with opportunities to prosper and thrive. The dream of owning a home is often hindered by financial barriers, making it sometimes an elusive aspiration. Five more minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. However, the future housing, with the Future Housing Project, this dream is now within reach, Mr. Speaker. By focusing on development, developing housing for young professionals, we are empowering the next generation of leaders, teachers, doctors, and entrepreneurs. And Mr. Speaker, when we talk about the future housing project, we are not just merely talking about brick and mortar. It's about building a solid foundation for which the aspirations of our citizens can flourish. When families have access to safe and comfortable housing, they are better equipped to pursue education, focus on their careers, and contribute meaningfully to the growth of our nation. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, the choice of location, Warner and Cotton Hill, further emphasizes government's commitment to providing youth with not just affordable housing, but also a serene and picturesque environment that they can call home. Mr. Speaker, join me a while. Close your eyes, Mr. Speaker. Imagine that you are in Cotton Hill, Mr. Speaker. You just came from a long day of work. You, you're sitting on your porch. You're probably enjoying a little BB, Mr. Speaker. It's just to keep it local, of course. That nice Cotton Hill breeze hitting you. Mr. Speaker, and you look down and you see that $12 million investment at that marina in Portsmouth, Mr. Speaker. I didn't close my eyes, but I can see the vision. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, Mr. Speaker, what I'm trying to say is that these are valuable lands that what this tells me is that this government simply wants the best for the young professionals, Mr. Speaker. And I think this has to be commended. And in my view, Mr. Speaker, on top of all of that, 
The most commendable aspect of this future housing project is the discounted rates at which these homes will be sold to our young professionals, signifying our government's genuine concern for the well-being of our citizens and ensuring that home ownership becomes an achievable reality for our young people. And Mr. Speaker, I realize my time is swiftly approaching, so I'm going to close. And I just want to stress that, you know, the achievements of this government speaks volumes, Mr. Speaker. Our track record is undeniable, and it reflects a strong dedication to the people of Dominica. Particularly, I want to emphasize the tremendous strides we've made towards our beloved young generation. Mr. Speaker, with full conviction, I commit to a meaningful contribution to this reset. I once again express my fullest support for this 2023-2024 budget put before this honorable house. And may God continue to bless our beloved country, our prime minister, parliamentarians, and each and every one of us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Levi Peters, Attorney General, I recognize you. Thank, you thank may you. proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, 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 think, I think it was a Peter Will the S I heard, right? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, I, I don't have too much to say because I think that um, the budget that was presented, we, we really could have gone home after Dr. McIntyre, Minister of Finance, presented that budget. The budget was totally and completely satisfactory to the, uh, the senator from, from Maragot. The ice cream man. Yeah. All right. No, well, the, 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 the bewildered member from Portsmouth. So. Your uh, Senator, I, I think Mr. I think the member for Portsmouth is on the government Mr. side. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, yes. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I don't think you should trouble yourself to yes. try to try to unravel that canon. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I think I think Mr. Speaker, you should just enjoy the view from Cotton Hill or from the ice cream factory or wherever it is. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the the fact is that I, I think anybody with that the right faculties would understand that the, the budget that was presented here by the Honorable Minister of Finance is one of the stronger presentations that we have had. And certainly, I think every objective person who listened or viewed the proceedings is fully aware of that. I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, my friends on the other side are well aware of that. They, of course, have to do their job, which is to come here and try to find things to say. Sadly, the leader of the opposition was so stunned, it appears, even with the assistance of um, the, Mr. Douglas, that um, what she presented, I don't think I recall any reference to anything in the budget. I may have missed it. I may have missed it, but I don't recall. I, I recall references, Mr. Speaker, to electoral reform, to CBI, to Sir Dennis Byron, to acceptability of the report on electoral reform, to all sorts of things. But I do not recall any reference to the budget itself. But, Mr. Speaker, what, it, what is absolutely clear is that, uh, and I think um, that one or two of the members on the other side actually tried to, um, to rec recognize and acknowledge uh, the brilliance of the budget. Um, but what is clear is that the budget is a budget that was crafted in a manner so as not to affect any of our citizenry um, as individuals in any significant manner. It is for that reason, um, Mr. Speaker, that um, we found ourselves with the Senator, Senator Reid, having to complain or, on behalf of credit unions. Mr. Speaker, credit unions are quite capable of looking after themselves. And the reality is, I think many of us in here, including me, are members of credit unions. I am quite content for the credit union that I am a member of, 
to make a contribution to the development of this country. And I see no reason why they should be in The idea that somehow credit unions and, uh, and any, the, 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 um, the uh, sum which they will have to pay from January is going to impoverish either the credit unions or the members of credit unions is complete hogwash, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that credit unions have developed, and we are all glad that they have, developed to a level where they are able now to punch at a significant level. In fact, some of our credit unions, um, some people say they are, have some equivalency to banks. I think um, the contribution that they will make to our, to our development uh, and to the, um, the members on the other side as well um, is really going to be very helpful. We, and we know that, uh, and in fact, the interesting thing is that a number of the members on the other side talk about how constrained things are financially in, in Dominica, how the economy is bad and this and that. And well, um, <coughs> Senator, Senator Paris is saying that's not him. He's saying that the economy is good. Well, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that he, he's now saying that the economy is good. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that we want all sectors to contribute. And so the credit unions contributing is, is a very positive, positive uh, contribution. Mr. Speaker, um, the, the, the um, Senator Douglas, um, I'm not sure why, but obviously he had some things to say and he found himself in some difficulty. But in particular, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if he listened to a, a different presentation or a different contribution than, than, than I did. Because um, I, I, I heard him make his contribution and accuse the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Dr. Um, Henderson, of um, a number of things, um, including um, making what he described, the Senator, as, as sexist remarks. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm sitting here um, maybe two seats away from Dr. Henderson. I didn't hear any of that. In fact, I, I recall Dr. Henderson at one point um, uh, spoke, and I think he said dare or something like that, and, and he, he quickly corrected himself. That was what I recall. So I, I, I'm not sure what, what, what triggered the, um, the, the... But I understand that they are, they are all comrades. From, uh, from, I, I understand they're all comrades from, from back in the day. So maybe, maybe that's a, a hangover from, from, from that time, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. So... so <laughs> But, Mrs. Speaker, I, I, I understand that they, they, they plan to, to meet and, and um, well, you know, thrash it out, I'm told, thrash it out. So, I, I mean, you know, every, every, everything here, Mrs. Speaker, we, we, we're, all, we're all friends, and um, I, I, hope, I hope that they can patch it up uh, before, we, before we leave, Mrs. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that um, there, there isn't a, a lot that needs to be said. I think I probably just need to, to um, I, I recall the leader of the opposition spoke of rampant inflation. I, mean, I, I don't think I heard anybody really address it, but I think at this hour, um, and based on everything that's been said, I don't know that it's the right time for me to trouble myself, but I don't think, again, that anybody would realistically say that we have rampant inflation in, in Dominica. That seems to me um, some sort of um, uh, flight of fancy, Mr. Speaker. Um, the the re re recurring decimal of, 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 of Members of the opposition belly aching about the size of the cabinet and how that, if it was reduced, all of Dominica's financial problems would, would suddenly uh, disappear. <coughs> um, well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, they're now saying that it's not all, but that's the impression that I get, Mr. Speaker. Um, all right. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, Senator Reid is. is um, I, I don't want to say she's disturbing me, but. Um, Senator, Senator, please allow the Attorney General to Mr. deliver. Mr. Speaker, could you, could, you, could you hammer that again? I like the sound. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <coughs> Mr. Speaker I, think, I think what is clear is that the, the IMF, which is being called for, um, some people say that um, it's being prayed for, is, is a long way away from us. And I think all of us, even those who make reference to it on the opposition side, um, do not really wish that we should find ourselves in that position. 
The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we are on, the, on a trajectory, which is a positive tra trajectory. We are, in a, uh, we are uh, as has been said previously, we are a small nation with a small population in a very difficult world. The world is a turbulent world, economically and otherwise. And the truth is that we have been doing remarkably well to have survived the way we have survived. As has been said already by other, other um, speakers before me, we went through um, Tropical Storm Erica. Within two years thereafter, we had um, Hurricane Maria. Within two years thereafter or thereabout, we had the um, onset of the pandemic. And here we are. Throughout none of that have we found ourselves in a situation where the government has had to send people home. It has managed to sail through that choppy, choppy sea of economic challenge with all hands on deck. And I think the government must be commended for that, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that so far as I am concerned, and I think so far as my friends on the other side are concerned, we all know that the budget presented by the Honorable Dr. McIntyre, the Minister of Finance, and the measures in that, which, which are well calibrated, which are, Mr. Speaker, um, measures that will have the effect of raising additional revenue without negatively impacting the, um, the, the citizenry. And indeed, Mr. Speaker, the many projects that are outlined in that budget are totally and utterly in line with where we want to go as a people and going forward. Mr. Speaker, the, 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 um, the, the budget uh, presented to this House is one which I have no difficulty at all in supporting, and indeed I give my wholehearted support um, to that budget. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I move that the House be suspended until 7 p.m. Second. Second. Hey, Mr. Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that the House be suspended until 7 p.m. this evening. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. House stands suspended until 7 p.m. this evening. Mr. Speaker. Thank <laughs> you.